Hey everyone, welcome to Limitless Radio Cast, episode 50. Listen in as we hang out with the wizard himself, Andrew Wilson. We cover a lot of great conversations and topics in this from hard training, different gym training, also bringing mental illness awareness to the forefront in all of walks of life. And remember, go out there and support our sponsors. That's RollAmongUs.com, Limitless20 at checkout. True Tubes Tattoo Supply, Limitless at checkout. BattleBomb.com, Limitless20 at checkout. Magic City Brewing Company, located in Akron, Ohio. All those sponsors make this show go. For Chad and I to bring content each and every week, we need you guys out there to support us, support them, share, like a show, write us reviews. Anything you can do will help us build our audience to keep doing this. We appreciate all of you. We hope all of you are doing well and take care of yourself. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the show. Hope all you guys are doing well out there and taking care of yourself and being safe. So today we're hanging out with a BJJ black belt and IBJJF pan no gi champion at black belt, as well as a five-time world champion in colored belts. He is the master of the buzzsaw passing series an OG of the daily fresh documentary, Mr. Panda express himself, Andrew Wiltsey. What's up, Andrew? Thanks for hanging out with us, Hello. man. Appreciate Thanks it. for hanging out with us, Hello. man. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited. So it's uh it's also very very cool man to see that you are able to get back on the mat man and stretch your legs behind your head i saw that video the other day and that, i was like that was Whoa. Nice <laughs> when, when i came back uh you know people do not realize the the absurdity of how bad of shape i was in i <laughs> you know i basically spent five months doing nothing just completely withdrawn from the world i, I sure. didn't leave my house for a, a week and a half one but that's not a joke like my sleep schedule completely inverted at times where i didn't see the sun like i uh i was struggling a little bit and when i came back you know i, I hadn't even done anything exercise why wise in five months so wow and then I walked back in the fucking Daisy Fresh and all these guys that used to just beat the shit out of were like, this is my fucking moment. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it turned out it wasn't though. So, but holy fuck, it was rough. Like the first 30 seconds of my first match back completely, I was completely gassed and fatigued. Like, uh, like full body fatigue. You can't close your hands. You can't oh, stand yeah. up. Luckily I was like in Mount already though. So I just would ride it out. <laughs> ride it out. So, Surf them. It was bad. And it took me about two weeks of just coming back and rolling and just kind of trying to survive and, um, be, you know, going on the offense, but really just using my technical knowledge and the ability to lean on stuff with all of my extra strength that I had put on. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was able to kind of survive for the first two weeks. And after two weeks, uh, I started really buckling down on my stretching routine. And then another two weeks later, I was able to put both my legs behind my head. And that's around when my weight loss finally caught up and I was able to really start to move again. Nice. So. Very <clears> cool. <throat> yeah, that's good. Uh, obviously, you know, that so when you first stepped on the mat, was there an aha moment because you were like, Oh, did you think you were going to lose more than what you actually did not being on the mat uh, for that long? Yeah. No. So this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been <laughs> right. Issues my entire life. And I've had one other episode before this when I was, uh, it, it was between purple and brown belt. And okay. I just completely kind of lost my way in life and, uh, didn't really have a good direction I was going. And I was living <clears> with a girl at the time instead of living in the gym. And it was, a uh, and it wasn't really a situation that I wanted. I kind of got that final ultimatum from an, a, an adult girlfriend where she's like, you, you know, you can move in with me or we can break up. And I didn't want to break up. So then my mental health just went. As soon as I left the gym, I knew I was going to be fucked because of how sure. I knew my brain worked at the time already. But I didn't want to break up with her. So I, I've been down this road. I've lost 50 pounds in two months before and got in shape again. I knew what I was in for. And I was dreading it. <laughs> I think that's actually <laughs> part of why it took me so long to do it again. Because like to really get the ball rolling on it. Because I knew exactly how horrible it is to come back and remember what you were. And sure, the movements yeah. you used to be able to do. And the ease that you used to be able to do them. And just the speed and the timing and the fucking cardio, man. Cardio, <laughs> the, when you yeah. don't have it, it sucks. And you know, just, uh, like I said, everyone in the gym was, you know, trying to murder me and I just was able to survive essentially. Like the first two weeks were not clean. I just wasn't getting tapped and no one could pass me still. And, but it was like, everything was making me way more exhausted. Like it, it is hard to remember being able to just kind of kick your legs over to regard, 
when sure. now you're fat and you, you don't have any flexibility and now you have to shrimp. <laughs> right. Shrimp, right. You have to change your technique. You right. ever actually want to do. <laughs> um, who was it actually? It, it was a big thing on Reddit recently where somebody high level in the community said shrimping is bullshit. I don't uh-huh. remember their name, but do you guys know? Uh, no, I didn't hear no, that. One. I didn't okay. hear it either. Yeah. And, um, I think it was, I want to say it was like Lachlan Giles or someone along those lines. Someone that's usually, you know, he's pretty smart and he has mm-hmm. a lot of Sure, yeah. Opinions. I remember hearing about that and just completely agreeing with him without even hearing the rest of the context because shrimping itself is like, to, I think of it like hitchhiking. You know, if I have to do it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a little fucked already. You know, <laughs> all the things that prevent you from getting your guard passed are things that have to happen before that. If I have to shrimp, it's because I need extra space because you've closed that space, you know? So it's like, sure. like a hitchhike. It's a Hail Mary. Shrimping is almost a Hail Mary. And it's nice to not have to do it. And when you're more flexible, you don't have to move your whole core to do stuff. You can kind of just bring your legs in at weird angles and it kind of opens all your technique and lets you conserve all your energy. So just describe my jujitsu game. I was going to say yeah. that's yeah. every time I roll really with chat. good about that. Yeah. <laughs> every time yeah. I roll with chat, it's like being flexible. And have, um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I can put but, one leg. I can put one leg behind my head. Not two. Not two. But not better, two. Better get on that. I mean, I'll be forty-seven this year too, so I feel oh, that's still pretty good, right? There's no way you're forty-seven. <laughs> yeah, not yet. I'm forty-six, but it's coming. I, I knew you were a liar. So, <laughs> <laughs> so and I got a I got a question, Andrew. When you made that yeah. one po- that one post last week and said like one sixty, here I come, or however you said that, are you really going to one sixty? Is that your plan? Oh it, yeah, no, I've done it before. Okay. Um, so if, a lot of people <clears> didn't realize this because this happened before date. So, all right, this is a Daisy Fresh origin story now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, like a lot of people don't know that Pedago submission fighting had been around for quite a while, and we'd been making waves in tournaments mm-hmm. without even having a black belt. Okay. So, like, I would always win everything at blue, and then when I went to purple, I won everything. And Heath wasn't even a black belt; yet, he was a brown belt. Okay. And I got my brown belts around when he got his black belt finally. So, like, we kind of, you know, we didn't have any big eyes on us because when we first started, the flow grappling didn't even exist. You know, like right. when I did my big run through at Blue Belt, Blue Flow Grappling was not a thing yet for for the Jiu Jitsu community. It was still like Budo videos recording the worlds. Mm-hmm. And when they decided that they they wanted to do the Daisy Fresh documentary, there was no real uh, game plan. I think it was kind of like Michael Sears and Simone came and they were just kind of filming some stuff. And they filmed a couple tournaments actually before the worlds, and they didn't end up using any of the footage for it. They filmed us in uh, IBJJF Chicago when I was a brown belt, and I. Uh, oh, okay. I think I I don't remember if I double golded or I think I double golded with divisions. I don't think I won the open that time. And then they went with us to the Nogi Pans. And that was again, I was a brown belt at the time. And this whole time that they're filming these, this was my comeback from the last time I let my mental health get the better of me. Oh, I, I see. Okay. <clears throat> wow. I was okay. losing weight in the in between these tournaments. So like when I did IBG of Chicago, I was a uh, you know, 195, and I was cutting a little bit of water weight for for medium heavy. And then when I went to the Nogi Pans, I had lost another 30 pounds. And I signed up for middle because I did, I wanted to be able to do the comfortable without having to cut mm-hmm. any water weight at all. I just wanted to be able to just unleash the fucking real bus saw because every time I have to cut, it always makes me a little more tired. Sure. And I did a very, very strict <laughs> diet leading up to it. You know, um, I, you know, I cut out like fiber and uh, carbs and sugar and everything like the last three days out so that my body really dropped all the water weight naturally. And when I got on the scale to weigh in for middleweight, I weighed 159. Oh, wow. man. And, wow. I, and I wasn't even fully ripped yet. Like my abs showed, but you know, I had to flex yeah. and I, I don't really have weak abs or anything. But like, <laughs> no, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> People just, they genuinely get confused about my size because I have a few features about me that are bigger. I have big biceps from pulling and doing jujitsu for basically over a decade and i have big legs because fuck me right and i guess i'm just not allowed <laughs> to move in gi pants that's why and they think that i'm huge but my frame itself is not very big right. and my height is it's a lackluster <laughs> i i do actually have an update on that so when I went to the doctor recently and then I got prescribed medication for my ADHD and everything, uh, they, me- they measured me f- again, finally. And I was excited because my whole life, I, you know, I kind of thought I was like five, eight on a good day. Well, turns out I'm five, nine with shoes on. So nice. I, I, Congratulations. I, I immediately like I immediately updated my Tinder profile. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. 
<laughs> like yeah. I don't care about anything else. So give me the med. All I want to know is d- give me the inch, baby. Five, five give me nine. The inch. You said f- okay. Hold on. Right. <laughs> hold on. You're right. Time so, out. So we have a uh, sixty is not unfeasible for me. And it's just I've, I know I, I can do it. I've already done it. It's just uh, after I did it. Then I stopped doing the strict diet that I was doing, and I got comfortable. And then that's why I did medium heavy again for the Nogi Worlds. Oh, so okay. That's when Daisy Fresh came out, and they used sure. the Nogi Worlds footage for the show that kicked it all off. Nice. Wow. Yeah. And that, and so yeah, Daisy Fresh was. So when we had you in, so you you came in and did the cancer awareness seminar at East Coast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually rolled with you. <laughs> Um, and, uh, I was the only, I was the white belt that walked up and said, I have old man strength. That was the best that you were like, Hey, you have old man strength. <laughs> I, st- I still wake up in cold sweats remembering, <laughs> ah, <so. let's> see. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny. Cause everyone always, they're like, Oh, you, you rolled with Andrew. I was like, look, dude, it was like 20 seconds, like 20 or 30 seconds. It's all good. And I said, they were like, well, what was it like? And I was like, his legs are extremely strong and really big. <laughs> and everyone's <laughs> like, really? And I was like, yeah, you wouldn't really know that until you rolled with him. <laughs> so you when can't you do bring- anything about my, so my legs at 160 were the same size as they were at 200. They literally didn't go, <laughs> they don't get any bigger or smaller. There's very little body fat on my thighs themselves. So so. You have no body it's fat like, on your thigh. Like they're, they're like tree trunks, you know, man. Like, like solid like as a, a rock. <laughs> I, I think of like Orlando Sanchez legs. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you feel you feeling know, good then now? Times. Oh yeah. No, no. Right now I feel pretty good. Uh, the biggest thing was being able to get the mental clarity back. Sure. Um, so much of it, of my, like what I did was to work around stuff that I had going on mentally and uh, just kind of keep trudging through while not ever being great. And I had a lot of little mental tricks, but you know, losing a lot of my ability to visualize and see things ahead of time in the roles was something that was really hurting my confidence for a long time. And it was starting to make me feel like maybe I just can't hang with uh, some of the better guys, even though like they're, you know, none of the guys look like they could even beat me up, but you know, if you're going to go against some of the, the really incredible, the people I consider incredible, I think that the top in the sport essentially right now are like the, the Rutilos and Micah Galvalo. Even if they haven't won as much as, you know, some of the other more accomplished people, I just think their ability to react in the moment mm-hmm. is exceptional. And that's going to take them very insanely far. And that's something I always had myself. And then over the years that it, it dimmed down almost. And it's like now it's back in full effect and I'm coming for that booty. Nice. No, no, no. I, actually, no. I actually like all of them a lot. They, they they look like they would be horrid matches to do. Like you're gonna throw up afterwards, even if you win. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's gonna so, be a high high paced crazy match. I, I, I have a lot of fucking respect for those guys, man. They're good. Oh yeah, I mean the high level guys. All you high level guys usually are. <laughs> well, yeah, I agree with that. But it's just like I, I see a difference in how they roll versus how some of the other competitors. Oh roll. yeah, and yeah. Okay, I see. Is, I see what you're saying. They yeah. still have. I still don't think they've refined it yet. There's still a lot of spastic <clears throat> in the Rutulos, is what it looks like. Yeah, you know? and it's fucking amazing spastic. But like, they're gonna get a lot better still. So yeah, they're gonna yeah, for sure, definitely. And they're what. We've talked about this before, but they're like 19, yeah, they're like 19 years old. So, you know, watching them, you know, go ahead, Chad. And that, and Micah Galval is what, 17, something like that. 18, maybe he's young. Oh, I didn't know he was that young. Okay. He's he's really young, but like those three guys you named Andrew, those guys go for the win, right? They're not just going to dick around and try to outpoint you the same way you roll. That's probably why you like their styles a little more too. It's just that, like, I was actually talking to someone on Reddit the other day about a, a bad idea that I had turning in my head about, you know, you'd see better takedowns if the guillotine rules were a little different. And they were, we were essentially talking about Micah, and they were like, well, he doesn't have any problem shooting. In the same way, you know, I'm, I'm kind of notorious. I shoot a lot in my roles, mm-hmm. in my tournaments. And it's uh, – th- the way I look at Micah is that motherfucker doesn't hesitate on anything. He's fearless. He yeah. full sends every single thing he does. Everything he does, he expects to get. And when it doesn't work, he's instantly moving to the next thing, expecting to get it. And that's uh, if you could idealize how I try to tell people to roll, it's that, you know, that is bus on Carnet. I was going to ask you, is that kind of where that, I mean, that mantra always came from you. And I know it's, like, a, it's we, a mentality. Sure. Right. Basically. I remember when you, when you were in and you bird was with you and we were, you, me and bird were sitting and talking about that stuff. And this was before buzzsaw came out. And that's actually what you taught at that seminar. You taught that style of, of the knee slice through the buzzsaw, you know, the buzzsaw cut. And, um, 
I always wondered, even then I didn't ask you so much then was that mentality was always that way when you first started going like with BJJ, you were just like, look, I'm just going to go get after it and just do it. Yeah. I've, I've had that actually since before I moved into the gym. Okay. okay. It was, uh, it, it came from when I was in the later stages of high school, I was around a senior. And then when I was first going to college and I had my whole entire personality and identity and core self revolved around being a good fighter mm-hmm. without the ability to train because there were just no willing partners or gyms essentially. And I was struggling to find partners all the time. And so I would spend a lot of time just really cranking out my conditioning and doing everything I could to get myself ready mentally and physically. And one of the ways I did that, it was like trying to figure out what optimized training would look like and what it would look like to like, what aspects can you improve outside of essentially technique, Sure. you know, cause I don't have anyone showing me technique and it's things like that. It's like whoever is moving faster and throwing out more attacks is more likely to win because they're going to be the one that's going to be able to create more openings and they're going to be able to control the pace. You know, whoever's controlling the pace is going to be more likely to win the match. And it all kind of stemmed from there. And then when I moved into the gym and I had Heath that started to guide me in a direction, he was telling me the same exact thing. You know, everyone uh, looked at me jumping around like a spastic um, honey badger with a white belt (laughs) on and just flying and jumping into triangles and shit. And, you know, a lot of people were just like, did you need to calm down? And Heath's like, no, 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 no. Don't fucking calm down drill a little bit and refine it like keep, <laughs> sure uh because it, it, you know he just he gave it a term essentially he's the one that came up with the term buzzsaw and it was never like something we were teaching he was just always saying you know fucking buzzsaw through the guy to try to get an impression across to you you know that you need to be relentless in your attacks because if i'm on the defense you're gonna win you know the odds are very good yeah that's a lot like um so we have a young man, what traces, he, he probably has that same time of kind of mentality. He's getting, obviously his techniques getting better. He's a white belt, um, four stripe white belt. He's very, very good, but he's attack. I mean, it's like constant, all of 60 matches in, a, in one year last year. And that's like everything It was just attack, 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 attack. Like he, if they were exhausted, every person either, either <clears> went against either submitted him or, or beat him on points because he, they just were like, we can't keep up with you anymore. Now he's what, 21, 22 years old, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's <clears throat> it. And you can lose that. Your coach can accidentally beat that out of you by giving you bad advice. You know, the coaches that are telling you slow down, focus on the movements. You, once you lose that mentality, it's very, very difficult to get it back in the primal state that you, you who you're describing probably has it right now, where they're, they have confidence in their moves when they're going for them. They expect it to work and they're going to keep going for the next one. Sure. Okay. So when you tell someone to slow down and focus on the moves, then, you know, they start to roll slower and they start to gradually lose that ability to turn it back up or because they're now they're training at that slow pace. When they do turn it back up, it's uncomfortable and they make mistakes and get exhausted. So that's why I tell people to keep the speed and keep the intensity, but you need to refine the technique and the movements and the pattern recognition by drilling and by actively focusing on stuff and not just rolling when you're rolling, but roll to try to get the stuff that you're drilling. You know, the fastest way to get good at something is to break it down into components you can work on individually, get those mastered, combine them, work on them together, and then look for resistance, look for ways to improve it, look for uh, follow-ups, or you're going to need to chain off this and this, and it's just a process. It's, that's actually, it's kind of crazy because it, this was, it's what, 22 now, 2022. So it was 21 when we, saw, when I got to hang out with you or whatever, when you were into the gym and I still like that deep underhook, hard grip on the shoulder with the knee right in the gut, you know, after you cut through and keeping the one arm out to the side and kind of just keeping them in that position where they're trapped. And I, every time I think, man, this is when Andrew was here. And I do that a lot. Like if it's a top game, like if I'm, X passing or whatever I'm doing to come through. Like that's my instant. Obviously everyone always wants to do the underhook, but I'll grab that right under that armpit right behind that shoulder. <laughs> like, yeah, cause I remember, hooks. yeah, you were, you were, I remember like over and over, you're like, get in and just sticky, just get right on that. And it's worked for me, but I'm also six two, two hundred 217 pounds. So <laughs> I'm a bigger guy. You can, so it's a, you can reach out from everywhere. I can. And you know, what's can, a, a funny little story on the development of the concept of sticky hooks in my head. So for a long, long, long time, I was like by far the best person in the Daisy Fresh gym. And I would, you know, like I, I had people that would push me and people that could push me in certain areas and people that focused on certain areas. And they uh, like George and his lasso, for example, he had a, 
he's a better lasso guard than I do because it's his only thing he does essentially. And most of his, it's where he puts most of his focus. It's his game. Mm -hmm. And you know, so if he uh, let him get me in lasso, I'm going to have to deal with like a good lasso now because that's what he does. And we got to have this fun back and forth arms race of me trying to figure out new lasso passes in order to deal with his fucking annoyingly strong lasso. And then when I'd figure out a way to start shutting it down and really passing him, he would go to the drawing board and come back and be like, well, what if I do this motherfucker? And then we would have this, like, it was literally like an arms race. Okay. And with the development of the sticky hooks, you know, like I didn't have to have the stickiest hooks all the time because a, the people in the tournaments were never ready for me to do it because of the speed intensity and timing that the, like the diving knee slice would come at, sure. you know, they never really got an opportunity to defend it. I'm just already in and through. And it wasn't until I trained with uh, Dante Leon, actually, really made me come go back to the drawing board a little bit. The very first time I ever rolled with him. Uh, and this was when I was a brown belt. It was right before the Nogi Pans, before uh, I won at 159 and Daisy Fresh and all that came out. I went up to his gym, me and Bird. And, you know, what, he wasn't part of our team. He's just, we've always fucking thought he was awesome. We watched him do what we did, you know, just be another American on the podium when it's all Brazilians. And he's a cool guy. And uh, I had some success knee slicing him, but then there were times I like, I got my underhook. How at the time I was like, yeah, I got this shit, and he would get away. And I was like, all right, why? And I had to go back to the drawing board a little bit and start developing some new concepts to deal with it, and, and mentally come up with new stuff for the next time I rolled with him. And that's why I started really developing how I'm going to squeeze with my chest to reinforce it. Uh, it really nailed home not reaching for the underhooks and just not giving away that I'm going to knee slice him because Dante is smart enough to know if he's in De La Hiva and I start looking at his arms funny, I'm about to knee slice his ass and he has to <laughs> let go of De La Hiva right now or he's fucked. So he preemptively lets go, preemptively gets rid of the underhook and just doesn't play De La Hiva. Okay, so it's like, well, now I got to get closer to trick you into grabbing the underhook or giving me an underhook option. And then you just have this development of the game. And that's, again, why it's important to fucking cross-train and not be little culty fucks that don't let your people go to other gyms. Okay, you right. should encourage it because you're just going to not get perspectives otherwise. You know, like, you can get a lot better being the, the better guy in the gym, the world beater in your gym. You really can, okay, as long as you're training intelligently and not just showing up and rolling because then you won't get much better. But that still is not going to recreate world-class level pressure in certain areas or just things you just don't know what you don't know and what you're going to run into either. So you need to go out there and experience it. And the way people say to do this is usually to go compete. And I kind of don't think that's the best way to do it. Okay. Because you really, you're only trying to go for your A game and competition. You only have that one time. There's so much pressure. Your timings are going to be fucked up if you're not perfect. And that's honestly not the best way to have insight into technique sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. not consistently. You will run into like I've definitely gotten a lot of uh, epiphanies. Uh, I've, I always steal shit that people do to me. <laughs> so, uh, I like it fucking worked on me, so I might as well do it. You know, don't have you swallow the pill, don't sure. have pride, and just do it. But you know, if you actually go and visit other gyms and you get to train multiple rounds with the guys there, you get to see patterns and what's not just a one off, and then that's going to help you develop your technique a lot more than just competing. Sure, that yeah, makes total sense. That perspective for sure, because. You're not going to get good at things. I tell people all the time, like if you're not willing to step out in adventure in a different avenue to better yourself, you're going to end up failing more than you are have going to have success in your life, probably. You know what I mean? And that's the same concept in terms of you step out of the gym, go train with other people. And I like that. I've never really heard that perspective. And Chad, maybe you have of, you know, go to another gym and train hard, go to another gym and train hard, you know, obviously know where your home is, you know, you know, you're loyal to your home and stuff like that for your home gym, but like go and train and all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, like, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Didn't I? <laughs> I did. I was, I, I, I go ahead, Andrew. So yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment. I was going to wait till you finished. And no, no, you're good. Yeah. With my, my goldfish memory, but the whole thing you were saying made me think of the term Creante and how much I fucking hate that term, how stupid it is and how toxic it is, you know, cause there you, you, you should have, you know, some, whatever deserving level of loyalty you want to give to your home gym. Okay. Cool. I have a fucking sure. tattoo of mine because, right. okay. It, it was literally life-changing and life-saving for me, and I got to have my dream enabled to the point where now I'm doing fucking podcasts, okay? <laughs> you know, when I was just some weird kid who used to think he was a wizard. 
So you know, I literally got to live my dream because of Heath and because of the gym, and, and I, I got to do all of that. So it, this means a lot to me, and so I'm I'm grateful and I'm loyal to that. Okay, but there are a lot of good reasons to leave a gym. Okay. And oh, for sure. The, yes. The response definitely. from people is what can make it toxic because imagine you. I've heard people getting upset because people had to move and for work. You know, people that used to be friends get upset because Joe has to go to the another state and and essentially make a living and then you're upset at him because he's going to train somewhere else in that state you know, he's just supposed to quit jujitsu because he can't be with you it's the same mentality of a, of a guy that or a girl that's just too jealous in the relationship too controlling okay and that's just toxic to begin with um you know and there's a lot of good other reasons you know sometimes you're not there for world-class technique you're there for environment okay and jujitsu is good for people in that it can give them a good sense of camaraderie and friends, especially people that aren't social and don't like to go out to bars or have real hobbies that induce making new close relationships. Mm. And what, if you're in a gym that's got amazing technique and the guys are all bros and you, you know, you're vaccinated and they're uh, MAGA hat wielders, you know, like <laughs> you're gonna, you might have a better time at a more um, sane gym. Okay. So there's a lot of good reasons. Um, you could have personal problems with people in the gym themselves. Like, I just don't have any problem with people going to other gyms and training because, like I said, and uh, you shouldn't be the jealous boyfriend in these situations. You should sure. be happy your friend, who you know allegedly he's your friend, is found someone else to make him happy. You know, there's just more positive ways to look and act around situations. For sure, definitely, especially in our uh, and I say our world because being in BJJ, it can, you can have that at any place you go to, you know what I mean? Like all that stuff that you brought up, Andrew, like you can have that at anywhere you go and train. So it's definitely important, especially obviously we talk on the show a lot about wanting people to do jujitsu or to understand that it can change your life, whether you're a hobbyist or if you're young, you know, my six-year-old or six-year-old, he's eight now. Um, he trains in jujitsu because I do it and he wanted to do it. So it was like, Hey, I want to do that, which is awesome because I'm like, look, this is probably going to change different than his brother and sister who did martial arts, but it was Taekwondo. Nothing that's, I'm not saying anything is wrong about it, but you know, they got a black belt in three years. <laughs> My we, we, we all know. <laughs> I know what you're not saying. <laughs> right. Right. I, I appreciate every bit of martial arts out there because I did it all when I was young, <laughs> but I did too at 42 years old. Yeah. 42 is when I walked in the gym, you know, BJJ was just something like you brought up a thing about having you know, pedago tattooed on you. So I have East coast tattooed on my arm. And a lot of people were like, man, you haven't been here that long. Why would you get it? But I found something that I never thought I would find in my life. Cause I deal with, um, mental stuff too. I have mental illnesses that I've dealt with, but I grew up rough. I grew up very odd and weird and had a lot of weird things happen to me, but it was like a family to me. Like, I was like, wow, I never thought I was going to find something like this. And I loved it at the same time because, you know, who doesn't like to get choked and, need and all that good stuff well, you know <laughs> doesn't like to get choked you're right <laughs> that actually brings up a pretty good a pretty good point that i see misrepresented a lot in my opinion the whole concept of jiu-jitsu being for everyone is fucking completely bogus it's not okay like you, i'm i've spent some time thinking back to like what if i was just a normal adult all right and i walk into a gym and then go and roll for the first time ever you know, as someone who hasn't been in physical altercations much in their life, someone who's just lived a, you know, a traditional normal life, and then uh, everything is scary. You're fucking exhausted. You're getting manhandled in a way you're, you've probably never even thought could happen to you because, like, most people have some perception of themselves as being able to catch a punch out of the air or something like <laughs> right, that. You know, just right. haven't been tested in reality. <laughs> yeah, right. And you get just completely manhandled by a tiny little fucking 125-pound purple belt you know, or a girl or something like that. And it's sure. like, how do they react to that? You know, especially people that are out of shape, which almost everybody is, even people that run marathons can come and roll for the first time, get exhausted. So yeah. if you're out of shape to begin with, with no actual grappling history whatsoever, it's, it's gotta be just this horrible experience. And <clears throat> it makes sense that that's just not for everyone. Not everyone wants to risk injury every class. And the idea that jujitsu is safe is also stupid. This is, an, this is basically an impact sport, you know, with the amount of movement we're doing, the amount of sheer body <clears> mass <throat> we are moving at weird angles. Pe injuries are very common in our sport, despite the pedaling that people do that they're not. 
there. You're likely to get injured doing jujitsu over a long enough period of time. I also shouldn't be the spokesperson for jujitsu to get people into it. <laughs> I, would, I would have to lie to them and that would feel like a lie to me to tell them that it's, it's, that it's essentially safe, safe right. because it's not. Sure. And you know, it's really jujitsu is just not for everyone. Not everyone wants to risk injury all the time or be bruised all the time or get fucking strangled. I mean, I, I met some nice lady friends that did, but it's just, <laughs> it's not for everybody, you know? And I don't think everyone should like, uh, cause a lot of people, when they don't do it and they hear people saying it's for everyone, you know, they're like, well, what's sure. wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's just not your sport and that's fine. Yeah. Oh, we had a, for every, yeah, go ahead, Chad. I was just going to say, if it was for everyone, we'd all have thousands of students and be making a bunch of money, right? Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I've seen schools that had 500 students and they're, they're probably doing pretty good. That's but... a lot of students, right? I think you get up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a lot. But no, I know what you mean. I really think everyone in their heads when they first come to jujitsu, they really kind of wanted to do karate, uh, but it now it's been proven to not work so great in a real combat <laughs> scenario without sure. supplemental Muay Thai and mm -hmm. American kickboxing. Yeah, some other, work, yeah right? some other stuff. You know what I mean? Right. So, but it's the concept of kata and being able to do cool shit um, without resistance, essentially, that I think makes those appealing. It's the it's like the completely finesse an opponent without real struggle. Sure. Uh, which real fights, even with high level jujitsu, aren't quite like that. Okay, so but. That's why a lot of schools that make a lot of money have very watered down jujitsu mm -hmm. because it's if you want to train to be actually good at combat and actually good at jujitsu, you're going to have to have more intensity and you're going to be showing more honest techniques of, of you know, honest in sense of what's going to be more effective versus what's not. And the schools that have a lot of students and this is I'm not, you know, there's going to be exceptions and, and I'm hoping mm -hmm. this has gotten better, but a lot of the times they just are showing bad jiu-jitsu and they're not pushing their students and their students have a unrealistic expectations of their skill level in that sense, because they're <clears> also <throat> not, you know, those are the same kind of gyms that don't really want their students to go cross train. So uh, or, yeah, they yeah, don't want them to I compete. Do they don't want them to, yeah. Don't want them to compete. And <clears> like yeah. If they do compete and they lose, you know, I, I've actually, uh, I have personal experience with this with my friend Clay Mayfield, actually. Okay, so you guys said you had Clay on here. Yeah, Clay, yeah. Clay's yeah. been on the show, yep. So the way me and Clay met, I was a white belt at the time, living in our, our second gym. So I'd been training for three or four months now as a white belt in the game. And Clay was a purple belt. And he came down to visit our school for the very first time. And it was me and the old A-team at the time. We were all white belts. There were no blue belts in that room. And Clay was a purple belt in the game. He, he did some local tournaments occasionally. He really thought he was – something else he was indoctrinated into a cult at the time he was really far gone into one of those crazy gracie systems that don't let you compete you have to bow to the master every time you fucking tie your belt like uh it was it's pretty bad okay and you know we just ran a train on him when he came in all of us with white belts on just fucked him up like brutalized him you know we were being nice about it but we were just like is he trying like, is this, re is this real? Is this a purple belt? You know, because yeah. we didn't even have a purple belt in our school. I think Heath had just got his purple belt, you know. So, clearly went back to his uh, his master, okay. <laughs> he was, like, asking him, how come, you know, I'm getting tapped out by these white belts? And then the fucking dude is just like, oh, don't worry about them. They're just doing sport jujitsu, okay. It wouldn't really work in a street fight. Sp Spider guard is bullshit anyways, you know. And he's like, well. They keep tapping me with spider guard. Uh, what do I do about it? And he's like, just don't worry about it. <laughs> like, oh, man. What the fuck am I supposed to do? Just get my ass kicked every time. So then Clay ended up uh, over the course of years, you know, we stayed friends and kept in touch. And he started slowly breaking away from the indoctrination and joined to compete at bigger tournaments because they told him not to compete at IBGF tournaments. Wow. You know, straight up because obviously I think they did it because they're, they're, they knew. Fucks, yeah. You know, and they know that that's going to be too eye opening for the people and they're going to leave, which is yeah. what happened. So Clay finally, when I was a blue belt and he was a brown belt already, I just won the Nogi Worlds and the Nogi Worlds open at blue belt. And I was in New York walking around and I had to borrow money to get a pizza slice from Heath and Clay called me out of nowhere and that's weird because i don't even have this weird old fuck at the time got my phone number <laughs> and he was like listen I, I need to ask you for a favor and you could tell he's embarrassed but he swallowed his fucking pride and he asked me if i would do private lessons with him when i was a blue belt and he came down for like a year and a half or two years and did private lessons with me once or twice a week uh he wouldn't stay for the night class to roll or anything he came down in the mornings for the drilling sessions and only worked with me because i think he was still a little nervous 
about going to the night class and he still had those other guys whispering weird culty shit in his ears sure, yeah and then when i finally i finally after like a year and a half got him to come to the night classes and he got to again experience rolling in a room filled with people that are doing well in competition for their belts and see what i've been teaching him what works what doesn't work what he needs to improve on and after that and he's just like all right i'll be down twice a week every week i'm gonna come train at the at the night class and then uh you know eventually he ended up joining the association but that was years later like we trained with clay and went to tournaments with clay and it's just the kind of the way our our school is you know when i say we don't have we don't do the affiliate bullshit because it's not important you know, so he, we didn't, need, we didn't talk him into joining our team. He made the decision himself. I think he would have made more money if he'd have stayed with the Colt because they're, they're good at making money. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, for sure. He, he but touched on some of that stuff whenever he was on, when we had him on the show and talked about doing privates with you. I, I believe he talked about doing privates with you and stuff. How, how that all, cause I, I asked him probably described it differently. <laughs> 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 this is the true story. <laughs> this is the true story. <laughs> um, crap. Oh, I totally forgot. Yeah, that maybe it made me think of uh, Clay being a purple belt and you being a white belt and going, "Oh man!" Like, so this is actually why I just I've never respect respected the belts in my entire jiu-jitsu career because I, I never had any perspective on them whatsoever. Because when I when I first came down and I was a white belt in the gi for like four or five months before I got my blue belt and I only did like like a few tournaments <clears> at white belt before I got my blue belt because I did I just I literally knew nothing about the gi. And I knew n no advanced guard whatsoever. I didn't know what X guard was or single leg X. I didn't know they existed. I didn't mm -hmm. know the concept of them existed. I knew what close guard and half guard was and butterfly guard. Okay. I didn't know that uh, like De La Hiva, reverse De La Hiva, spider guard, lasso, worm guard, no, nothing. I had zero knowledge of anything. Okay. So, you know, Heath got me drilling everything, and I had already kind of mentally primed myself from doing my nogi judo with my old judo coach, Mike Ogden, on and off, because he, right. it was an inconsistent class, and he got hurt a lot, and it was just – it was a fucking mess. But I would drill everything so much and so hard that, you know, it only took me one month to catch up to everyone in the gym as a white belt because when <clears> I first <throat> moved out, I got tapped out a lot, and I was getting tapped out for the first time ever, and it was discouraging, and I was like, fuck that. <laughs> I'm not okay with that. What do I need to do to fix it? And I just worked so hard and I had so much confidence in my moves because I drilled them so much. And, uh, and I was young and, you know, like the Micah Gavala, if I was going for it, I was going for it with a hundred percent, everything I had sure. and full confidence. It was going to work. So then I would roll with black belts randomly in like St. Louis and all these other places. And I would fucking tap them out. And, you know, I would like X past them hard as fuck. And then I would jump into arm bars when they tried to post and I would tap them. And it was just normal for me to do that, you know? And then I would try to survive the rest of the round when they're coming at me with the fury of a black belt that just got tapped legitimately <laughs> by a white belt. And they still wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to do anything to me because I was unsweepable. Because if you knock me over, you couldn't keep me down. And then I was strong and I was fast and I had good grappling sense. So I was like not getting the full repercussions of my actions like I should have. And I'm not talking about world-class black belts, but these are like normal black belts, mm -hmm. okay? Sure. And then by the time I was a blue belt, then I was actually had technique I had developed and I had now I had uh, like a long time of drilling stuff and really having patterns I would feel comfortable with and reinforced. Then I would just fuck up the black belts. You know, I went to Texas and I went to a bunch of gyms in Texas because uh, George Valadares invited me down because he wanted me to go beat up all these fucking weirdo culty black belts. And <laughs> so he took me to a lot of different schools and I just fucked up every single black belt at every one of the schools. And I just was like, I just assumed everyone in the world sucked except for the people that competed. I didn't have perspective. I was like, well, the belts don't mean anything, you know? So why, right. I'll respect you if you're a cool person, but I'm not going to bow to you because you have a black belt because I'll tap you out. You know what I mean? And it, it was not, the, <clears throat> it wasn't really like a super healthy mentality. I was very young and inexperienced. And, uh, you know, I, I've definitely mellowed out a lot in my old age and everything. And had a yeah, old age, listen to you. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. But that's why I've just never had any respect for the belts because, you know, you could, if you can't, at the time I was like, if you can't physically beat me, you know, yeah, sure, you know, yeah. a lot of, I thought a lot of people got their belts without deserving them. And Did I was the a little belt bit more, system uh, get watered down more over time? And Chad, you know, I know I, you, you've been around a long oh, time. Absolutely. Obviously, Andrew. Absolutely. Did it get... Like, and I know I hear more about this. Um, and obviously, I mean, anyone that listens to the show, I'm a white belt, so I don't know anything. Okay. So <laughs> I'm just a, I'm a 40, soon to be 45 year old, three stripe white belt. I want to put that stripes on there. 
I'm happy. No, I'm just kidding. Because Andrew said belts suck. So I'm just going to say that my three stripe white belt's awesome right now. So anyway, I'm just, I'm just messing around everybody. <laughs> the water I don't down think it's part. possible to avoid it, not getting watered down. Right. And that's what I wonder. Imagine yeah. You, you run a gym and you've got a guy who just sucks. He shows up inconsistently. He's physically weak. He doesn't do any conditioning or drilling on the side. He's not learning new techniques over the years. He's just there occasionally. Ten years down the road, you've got to be giving him belts. You know, you're going to start getting accused of sandbagging. So now he's got his blue belt, even though he doesn't know anything. And now he's got his purple belt. You know, maybe he did some tournament and did good one time. Okay, now he gets his brown belt. You know, eventually that guy's going to get to black belt. And you know, it's not. Because you're going to get absolutely viciously attacked by the community if you've got a guy at brown belt for six years, even though you could make the argument he doesn't deserve his black belt mm. because he doesn't know enough and he isn't, he's not good enough at enough stuff. And he's just, he can't defend the honor of the belt from someone like me coming in as a white belt and fucking him up. Sure. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, so it's not possible sure. to avoid it down without really running into problems like that. And it makes sense. And I think the reasons why they give them the belts are they're going to be at least understandable okay and the belts aren't you know they, like i said i don't think they're that important to begin with i don't even know how to tie mine still i really don't <laughs> it's not a joke i don't know how to do it i just make knots and that's why i really wish there was a different comparison for competitors you know i don't i don't know how you would do it if it would be some stupid bar that you got if you're a competitive blue belt you know what i mean but oh right i talk about it all the time that a, a world-class blue belt you know, so like the guys that I went with a blue belt when I, you know, I beat Matias Luch 28 to zero at blue belt. So, and he's one of the best black belts in the world right now. You know, it's like, those are my competitors I came up with and right. him at blue belt would do, would have done the same thing to every black belt I rolled with when I was a blue belt. He would have just fucking rolled through them and there would have been, it wouldn't even been hard for him. Like it wasn't really that hard for me, you know? So like, I know for a fact, the competitive blue belt, but like I'm a world-class blue belt will run a train on your local hobbyist black belts. And it's, sure. it's crazy that I get pushback on this concept because you can't argue it. I've literally watched it. I've done it. I know people that could have done it also. Yeah. I could. Jim as a blue belt was at the same level as me. I, you know, yeah. and sure. he was fucking up all the black belts too. At the same time I was, I just didn't have any like following to make it public. Sure. Essentially. Right. And I was like an unknown dark horse and it, you know, so that's just the argument. Like, if you're a competitive blue belt, you're basically a professional athlete or you're training yeah. like a professional athlete. And then you're co trying to compare that to a hobbyist who works a full time job and trains yeah. two or three times a week. Yeah. And, yeah. That, you know, and that's, that's okay. Different system. Right? It's fine. It's fine. I have no problem yeah. with that. I, like I said, I don't think the belts are that important to begin with. I have no problem with you having your black belt, despite not being as good as, um, you know, like a competitive black belt, you know, you're not right. trying to be a professional athlete. It's just, sure. I don't think you should even compare the two. Right. Yeah. And that, I agree. That's my real argument. Yeah. You should not compare the two. Yeah. That's a huge difference. And that's how, like, when I approached it, when I even started um, BJJ, that was my approach instantly was going, I didn't really care about, like, yeah, is it cool? And, and I, does it make me feel a little good? Sure. But, for my grand scheme of things, it was all about me. It was all about testing myself. So it was like, I didn't care about a belt and I, and I still don't, I mean, yeah, do I want to get there? Sure. But I want to learn like technique, like I, and I'm a hobbyist, like, listen, everybody knows this. I'm a hobbyist, man. Come on. I'm going to be 45, but I, I'm more in that approach. Like I didn't care about the belts. I look at people going and I'm like, dang, they got some mad skills, like whatever they are, you know what I mean? Cause I'll watch flow, you know, Chad and I'll watch flow on, you know, whatever, who's number one or fight to win or whatever. And there'll be a no gi match. And sometimes I'll miss, I won't even know what rank they are. And I'll just see great jujitsu. And I'm like, wow. And then next thing you know, it's like, oh, well they were blue belts. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know that. That's wow. <laughs> you know? So I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying, Andrew. Like, uh, there's a lot of truth to that, especially now. Yeah, and we we've mentioned it many times on the show. Look at Colabate, that kid's 16, right? Just got his purple belt. He's a savage. He's a fucking savage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what what he's doing, you know, he he's really far ahead of the curve. But there have been other people like that. Yeah, you know? and that's also for sure. Reason yeah, why I think that the the time requirements are just absolutely. Yeah, they, they shouldn't. They should just should not apply to competitors. Right. Okay, because I would have been able to get my purple belt in one year, you know, after just doing one circuit and winning everything in blue belt, and then I could have gone through purple belt, and instead I had to wait two years, and then sure. I actually got accused of being a sandbagger when I was a blue belt because I had already won the worlds in the pans, and the <laughs> Nogi worlds in the open, and the, the pans, the Nogi pans in the open, and then I had to do it all again because I had to do one more year at blue, and people uh, really got okay. on my case about being a sandbagger, but there was nothing I could do about it. 
And we even messaged the IBGGF ourselves and asked if I could just get bumped along faster. And they told us to fuck off. <laughs> and, no, I'm serious. It was bad. I believe oh, it. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Like, threatened us. Like, so it was, it was bad, but it just should, it shouldn't uh, exist to begin with. Yeah. You know, it's not really uh, preventing the integrity of the sport from going away. And it's actually ironic that the IBGGF would ever even talk about integrity. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, the IBJJF, the, the, it's the only one or... Uh, I don't want to call it organization, or maybe that's the proper word to call it, you know, out of every major competing level, ADCC, uh, does all that matter still like belt levels? Just curious. Um, yes and no. Okay. Okay. So, so the, the IBGGL, what they do is they, they enforce the belt levels. Okay. But it's arbitrary because again, like when I was a competitive blue belt, there were brown belts that were winning the worlds at Brown that I could have beat up still. Okay, and then there were brown belts that would have kicked the shit out of me. You know what I mean? It's like sure, it, yeah, would yeah. Have, it would have depended on how the match went. Sure, sure, right. It's not it's not a given that they were going to beat me. There's no way. So that's kind of how it is. So when you just lump them all together, you're gonna like the like you can do with no gi, which you should be allowed to do in the gi. The gi is preventing things like like people like Colabate from being pushed faster. Right. The, the belt system. Oh, the okay. I see. Okay. Belt. You know, because Cole clearly demonstrated he could beat established black belts hmm. and not not sure, shitty, right. obvious black belts, but established black belts. But if it wasn't for that being allowed in the Nogi, he would have never got the opportunity and he would have just stuck to his own little lane on his belts. And it would have took him a long time to not only get, you know, get through the belts and get to the next one and do the tournaments there. You know, he he wouldn't have been able to develop the uh confidence in his technique that he has now because now he knows what's going to work now mm -hmm. sure, once you've oh, done yeah. it to a world champion black belt you know you know you're doing the right thing so he's gonna be able to develop his game a lot more smoothly and a little more confidence with that and how fast he became a fucking icon in the sport wouldn't have happened you know it doesn't happen without ha having like a ridiculous amount of spotlight on you because the aoj cult is fucking pumping your name all the time and all that or you have some big name that's making people aware of you. You know, winning is not enough. It, it, and the flow grappling can't cover every blue belt that wins the world right. in the same way. Or, you know? Oh, so right. The, exactly. He got to skip all the way ahead of that because he was able to compete up in belts. So, again, the belt system is dumb. Let them fight. You know? <laughs> Just let them go. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I see. I, that's, and I, I ask a lot of questions to our guests about that type of stuff. Cause I know EBI and ADCC and, you know, IBJJF obviously. And I'm always curious, like, especially you guys who have competed at the highest level, you know, and like, Hey, what, what rule set do you like best or what don't you like, or what should we change or what not what we should change? Listen, I'm not changing anything. Just a nice little, I'm an old man with three kids in a podcast. All right. With another old man across me with a really big beard. All right. So I'm not changing anything, but Andrew, what would you change? I, I have. Okay. So I have things that are still floating thoughts and I have things that I think for sure um, should be changed. Okay. And I'll mostly stick to like, first I'll stick to the IBGGF rule system because believe it or not, they do have a pretty good rule system. And I, you know, like, I'll talk about my uh, problems with like the different systems, like sub only and all that. But if we start with IBGGF, okay, they have a pretty good point scoring system and the advantage system is fine, okay? Um, there are some weirdness in them though, okay? So when you're talking about rule sets, you have to talk about incentives. What does this rule set incentivize the competitors to do? Okay, for example, sure. so, like if you're talking about how do you make people be encouraged to go for takedowns, there's different routes that you can go. If you make takedowns be more points, you encourage people to pull guard that are not comfortable in their takedowns, and you'll get more people pulling off the bat instead of risking their uncomfortable takedown game. And that's not your intention at all. It's the opposite. You know, and that's also why we, uh, we test things and we uh, evaluate. Okay? Mm -hmm. But things that for sure, for sure should be changed. It's stupid that I could take you down to side control and get two points, but if I took you down – let you get a half ass guard and then pass you. It's it's five. it's five. Okay. Mount is considered a position. Positional scoring it has nothing to do with guard passing to get there. If you're in mount, you get it. Side control and north south should be combined in the one thing, and they should count side control points. Guard passing points are stupid. Okay. And the reason uh, there's a lot of things I think exist because Brazilians don't like wrestlers, and they were losing to wrestlers in ways that they couldn't swallow at first. That's one of them because wrestlers take you down to side control. Now you're down. You would have been down five, but they can, you know, they can be down two and maybe get back in the match. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
um, the guard polling rules as they currently are are very, very bad. You know, I actually think it's great that you need to touch someone to pull guard because it gives at least a window for someone who's <clears throat> worked a lot on their wrestling to have advantage and the ability to do something. Okay. And we don't want to overly focus on any one aspect of the sport when it comes to competition. We ideally, they all have some kind of equilibrium that's been balanced out in the sense, like if, you know, if you're balancing a video game and you're adjusting variables, okay, but we can only adjust the rules. So uh, right now, if you double guard pull and then I come up off the double guard pull, I get an advantage. And that's how we get the memes of like Craig Jones showing optimal guard pulling strategies where they're both doing the level change. Right. Thing. Hmm. Yeah. Because that's a fucking real thing that happens. Okay. So imagine the scenario I try to, you know, I'm, I want to, I'm committed to trying to take you down. You want to pull, you get the pull off when I try to take you down. I don't get my two, but I also don't get the advantage. If I had just double pulled with you, I'd be up an advantage. So by trying to display more skill and be more aggressive and, do what everyone i think would consider a better thing i've been punished okay now if you just take that rule and you make it i automatically get an advantage every time you pull it completely changes the game a little doesn't it okay so now i now at least now i'm incentivized to still try to shoot you as the guard puller get an advantage in the match itself because you choose how the match is going to go you're choosing guard you know what i mean so yeah, you yeah. you get that natural advantage just from having chose how that's going to happen. And I've gone back and forth with iterations on this. At first I thought it should be one point maybe, but I don't I don't think that anymore because if it's points I have to fully sweep you in order to not lose. Okay, but if it's an advantage, I can eat the advantage and if I can't at least get <laughs> one advantage on you while you're trying to stall, I don't deserve to win still. So, are you able to like reach out to IBJJF IBJF? or yeah or or, okay that means so I mean uh, I mean you could but I could but I don't expect anything to happen okay so that committee is like just locked tight where nothing's changing that's locked that's locked the IBJJF had had some bad fucking history and uh (laughs) the fact that they they post things about me now occasionally is ironic as hell because they were not buddies with me back in the day they hated me (laughs) Okay, I was you know, I was like the American that was fucking up all the little Brazilian kids and the only American on the podium every single time and they legitimately had it out for me. And I, I I could tell stories about that, but it's it's a fucking rabbit hole. So those are some two easy rule changes. Sure. Okay. You can p- give some kind of penal- penalty to a guard puller that at least uh, they have to consider. You know, and what they can do, you know, you can still have rules where if I shoot and you sprawl and I shit off the sprawl. Maybe that's not an advantage, but you can start to actually talk about little things like that and whether that's part of the rule set or not, and right. you can see how it's going to go. Um, other things to encourage takedowns, like like I said, adding points doesn't really uh, help in the sense that people are still going to pull guard. Okay, mm-hmm. the thing I was talking about on Reddit the other day, when I said as a you know Reddit's you know of course the most rational community in the world and they're great at having discussions with an open mind and not just being <laughs> attacking and being mean spirited okay so i've thought about this for a while because one of the things that i notice and something even i notice in myself occasionally is that if you're scared of getting guillotined you're not going to shoot it's like being gun shy to box you're scared to get punched okay and you can you can watch it in wrestlers that get guillotined a couple times and now all of a sudden they want to play tie-ups right and i've noticed that if you take guillotines out of the equation people are suddenly uh they're they're level changing again and they're setting up shots and shots are i think a more a more efficient and effective way to take someone down than a lot of the collar tie stuff okay and they're just they're more exciting to watch you know i think they're just all around healthier and you know it adds a lot more dynamicness at least to the sport instead of the slap fests that we see in some of the who's number one stuff. Mm-hmm. And like I said, I think the reason why they're slap boxing instead of wrestling, even though they're better wrestlers than they're displaying, is neither of them wants to be the one to shoot because it doesn't make sense from a strategic standpoint. Okay, because if you're going against someone who's moderately okay at wrestling, this you know, and you're pretty good at wrestling too, the chances of you getting a clean double leg are going to be a lot smaller. Okay, but the odds of you getting a half ass double leg and getting fucking brutally guillotined are very high. Uh-huh. Okay, and then that's why they I think they don't shoot, and that's why you see so many upper body tie ups that just <clears throat> don't go anywhere for a long time. And if the, the what I was thinking, you know, I was thinking we could I could introduce my unique way of looking at it to the community, and we could just uh, talk about different ways to approach that rule set that's encouraging these slap fests. Okay, 
And the way I was looking at it was that the ADCC already doesn't permit points for the first five minutes, which has, uh, I'll talk about that next if you want me to. I don't like that. Sure. Yeah. But we are, mm-hmm. we already have a precedent for certain things being, uh, in the first time of the match or not. Okay. And we already have a precedent for certain submissions being legal or not. So if you just combine the two, you know, no guillotines for the first three minutes or some arbitrary number, you'll actually get exciting wrestling matches again for the start of the match. And yeah. like I said, I, I've run wrestling practices in our gym where you're allowed to guillotine a nine, and as you can see a marked difference in people willing to shoot. Yeah. So honestly, that was, my idea. That was one sense. of the yeah. But yeah. I really wanted just a discussion. I want people in the community to be thinking about this yeah. and figure out how we can actually improve instead of just being okay with current status <clears throat> quo that people are unhappy with because no one likes those matches. Sure. Yeah. What do you, Andrew? What do you think? Um, because you've done who's number one. Do you like the longer time limits? Fuck no. I, I didn't think so. Yeah, I don't. I don't I, yeah. Not only do I not like them for a personal reason, because who the fuck wants to roll against another world class guy for 15 minutes? Right. Okay. But I also think they're not good for the match itself. Right. right? Because no matter what, every motherfucker will lie to you and be like, oh, I'm still giving it my all the whole 15 minutes. No, you're not. You nah. motherfucker. <laughs> you're not. You're conserving right. energy in some level, either subconsciously or consciously, for a 15 minute match. Yeah. Okay. And you'll have bouts of intensity and bouts of non intensity. And everyone, no one wants the non intensity. Six minutes and seven minutes, y- you know, you could, you could probably, sp- you know, some of us more athletic people can sprint for seven minutes. Not really, but yeah. You, there's sure, just, you right. can keep the intensity up the whole yep, time. Exactly. And you'll <clears throat> get a lot more exciting matches without having those long, arbitrary time limits. And the reason I think they exist is you know, black belts are more likely to find themselves in stall positions against other high level guys because you both are good. But at the same time, I think it's also encouraging that to happen. Absolutely. Sure. And I think that's what happened with, with EBI is people were just trying to get to overtime. Right. I'm, I want to fucking talk about your, let's do, it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> Go ahead. Right. Um, the system itself, like the overtime rules were the least thought out thing I've ever heard as far as a rule set like, in terms of incentives, because if I'm going to do an EBI match, Okay, and I know the guy's kind of hard to tap. You know what I'm going to do to get ready? I'm going to only work those two positions that I get in overtime. Because if I don't want to get tapped by anyone, you're not tapping me in a certain amount of time. Gordon Ryan will fucking struggle to tap me in a certain amount of time if I just decide not to go on the offense and I just don't want to get tapped. Okay, so I can guarantee get to the overtime position, which is where I've really been focusing all of my time. Because the rule set gives you a bonus (laughs) for doing that. Okay, and now because I've spent all of the last month playing only from the back or the spider web position, I'm probably going to win because I was able to stall to overtime. Right. So it's just bad incentives, and that's okay, why I, see. I think people need to understand the, the incentives are what matter when we talk about rule sets. Well, I don't really have um, <clears throat> good optimization for the EBI rules. I actually just read on the the uh, flow grappling Discord where someone said, well, what if you could only get a position that you actually actively got in the match? You know, there's ways to switch it up, and I think that's not a bad idea. It at least is the discussion going in the right direction. Sure, right? yeah, that's it, so. yeah. Uh, that's what I was going to ask you now, you know, because I know you've competed a lot with um, Flow and on who's number one and, and fight to win and stuff. Um, has there been discussion for those rules to change, like l- seven, eight minute matches or six, seven minute matches instead of the 15. Oh God, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's funny. We talk I, about I, it on I the show know. all the time. Cause I love it, but I go, man, it's hard to watch it for 15 minutes. <laughs> Cause I'm like, come on, but they yeah, have done a, but, I've, I've given them props. They've done better over the last several weeks and months that where well, the refs have been on them about but moving. I, 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 I think it also depends on who the grapplers are, right? Sure. sure if sure, you, sure. if you have, a Rotulo brother in the match, it's probably going to be an exciting 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cause, cause they're Which, everywhere. He was but one of the ones I have, said a couple weeks yeah, ago. I was like, Oh, yeah. he was like nonstop the whole time. Yeah. But then you have other matches like, um, Nikki rod and who was it? He had last time. That was just oh, a wrestling Tim, match. That wasn't Tim Springs. Was it? No, 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 no. no, no. no. That was, I, I okay. can't remember. Anyway, I, I don't remember who it was, but it was just on their feet slapping yeah. the whole time. The Again, whole time. Like Andrew said, yeah. nobody's taking a shot, you know, so you they, get they actively are stalling while they're standing. They're pretending yeah. they're gonna go for stuff. Right. Um, and that's something that just happens a lot. It, yeah. it, it all over the place, but it, it, you really see it a lot more in stand up. The the who's number one rules, so the way they're my perception of their mentality is people don't like points because they think you'll become a point fighter and people think point fighting is stupid. Or less okay. exciting than uh than like a like a submission. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I kind of agree with that, but I also disagree. Um 
points are just a way of keeping track who is winning overall. You mm-hmm. know, it's like pretending that the positional stuff doesn't matter when you're saying points don't matter, which I think that's not true. I think positional dominance it's kind of an integral part of the the fucking sport guys i was gonna say yeah it's kind of there's more to it than just jumping on guillotines and toe holes right 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 Right. and what they did is instead was you know they tried to try to have multiple judges that are trying to weigh everything and i'm on board with that you know you're gonna run into weird stuff where uh you know you're now you're really giving the judges a lot of leeway so you really better have good judges and you better be clear on what they're getting their uh, decisions based on which i think they do a good job of and i think the who's number one does a fantastic job of showcasing the athletes and getting sure oh definitely definitely um i definitely but i do like point systems i I think uh and this ties into my dislike of the adcc rule set if you take away the point system you take away a lot of incentive to go for stuff You know, like why uh, it's a lot easier. Let's be honest. It's a lot easier to wrestle up from guard than it is to wrestle. In general. Yeah. Okay. In general, it's less exhausting. It's less risky. Mm -hmm. You know, the odds of you getting guillotine in a single leg from a wrestle up from behind are a lot lower than you just shooting in and doing a guillotine. Right. So if you're in an ADCC rule set, you know, a lot of the times you don't see a lot happen in the first uh, half of the match, because why would I spend half of my energy taking you down and passing your guard while you're a shirtless sweaty fuck who's probably greased up yeah. and you're able to get out of side control and then uh you know i did i did, all of that was pointless for me i got nothing out of that except for more tired than you who just played defensively so my incentive to go for stuff isn't really there you know um, unless you're for sure absolutely confident you can tap the guy from those positions you, you're not actually getting any advantage in the match itself in the long run from it by doing all of that work so that's mm-hmm. a bad incentive okay and then uh that's you know I think the some sometimes I think the same way a little bit about who's number one but not really because again who's number one is actually paying attention to everything and if if I took you down and got into your back you know at the start of the match and who's number one they would they would weigh that okay. oh yeah 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 for sure that's the difference and that's why I think who's number one is doing a pretty good job for fight sure. to win rules are again among my least favorite too I, maybe I'm just a hater <laughs> <laughs> just, no you're just, just being honest which which is good. Um, with the fight to win rules, you know, the whole point of scoring subs and slams, you want to incentivize slams. Okay, I'm all right with that. Um, that makes a little bit of sense. Um, scoring points but not positions is really stupid because I, I could take you down, pass you your guard, get in your back. Uh, you get away. I repass you, remount you, get in your back again. You get away. You dive on one toe hole. One toe, yeah. You have won the match. Yeah. You did not deserve uh, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a bad rule set overall. I think it's just a bad rule set. Um, but I, I see where he's trying to go from. I think he has good intentions there, but he, it just doesn't stand up to scrutiny in my opinion. When do you think you'll compete again on it? On the fight to win? Yeah. Ask me another question. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I genuinely I'm, actually hate that rule set. I despise it. I think that's, what, that's why I asked you. <laughs> cause I, cause I figured, um, are you, are you Go going ahead, to do Chad. ADC? Are you going to do the West Coast trials, Andrew? Those are the ones in April. I, I believe so. So those are what I'm eyeing right now, tentatively. Yeah. Uh, okay. I didn't know. So at first, I was like, people kept asking me when I first came back, and I weighed fucking two thirty, and I could get thirty <laughs> seconds, you know? Right. Um, and I'm like, probably not. But then I I managed to lose more, you know, thirty pounds in a month, and like now, you know, it, I've been back about five weeks, and I'm I'm seeing like one ninety three, one ninety four in the scale again. Right. And I can move really well. So now I'm like, you know, maybe it is realistic. But, you know, I still have to get my physical conditioning way up. Like I have videos of me rolling right now out. And I'm clearly I'm moving great. My flexibility is up. My timing is actually better than it ever has been because of the fact that I have that mental clarity back. My cardio cardio is not there yet. And I'm working on it hard. But it does take time. Yeah. Now, is it even possible for me to lose enough weight to do sixty or seventy-seven, which is my what I want to do? Right. That's going to be iffy, okay? Because I don't want to do. I wouldn't want to do a big water cut for something like the the trials and just right. go out there and get exhausted in five seconds sure. and just fucking look like an idiot essentially, especially while not being in prime shape because it just takes a while to get back into t- t- top five in the world shape. You know what I mean? <clears throat> uh, so it's going to come down to. Can I lose the weight fast enough, which I'm losing as fast as you physically can while still training? Right. Okay. I'm losing six plus pounds a week. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you're at the, you're probably at your max 
capacity I did the math to on lose. This. I literally yeah. counted every single calorie and I do the same routine every day of every week. All right. Five to six pounds of body fat without <clears> adding in any other factors behind weight loss other than calories burned and calories taken in. That's what I'm at. Okay. Minimum. And the, what is it? 40 days away. Yeah. That's uh, tough. When I'm seeing, when I'm seeing 193 in the scale, that's not pure body fat loss yet. You know, that's a right, clean, right. cleaner diet, making my water weight fluctuate. That's after training and depending on how hard I'm training that day, multiple sessions, how hot it is in the gym, what I'm doing that day. Yeah. Yeah, because you're going to swell up, but, you know what I mean? Like your, your muscles are yeah. going to swell, fill of water, all that stuff. Yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of fluctuation, but it's consistently going down by this Good. amount each week. And I just don't know if it's physically possible to get down to 167 in that amount of time. Yeah. I, I mean, I might do 88, but then that's just going to come down to if I'm even in shape enough to do it. Sure. You know, so. That's a big See, ask of yourself, it's, but it's, one... it's looking very likely though. Good. I'm feeling good, pretty man. good. And I think, good. I think a few guys uh, got away with a little too much while I was on a hiatus. <laughs> Chad, what were you going to ask? You, well, I, yeah. So say you win trials at 88 kilos. When you go to ADCC, do you have to do 88 kilos? I'm guessing yes, right? I, I don't fucking know. I'm not sure. Uh, I, I thought I, don't, I, don't I, thought I heard. So, I, no, I know you don't. I thought I heard somebody say you win trials at whatever and you go to ADCC with, you know, whatever class you want to do. But that doesn't make sense either. So, you know, we were talking earlier about like y y people don't believe I could make 159, even though I've done it and right. I physically haven't put on much muscle since then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the thing about this is that people see me winning the worlds and being number six in the world at 88. All right. And it's just not my weight class. Uh, right. The guys are fucking sure. huge. And the reason they're losing to me is because they're idiots. <laughs> they, they lost to a fucking uh, mental case, essentially. Not that was a joke. Okay. The guys I've gone against are great. Um, but like, I, I really genuinely feel like I shouldn't be able to win at that weight class if we're just going on like size, mm -hmm. you know, my matches at 88 are significantly harder for me than my matches at 77 or under because at 88, the guys are all taller than me, which is, it's not hard to be taller than me. Let's be honest, but they're also broader than me while being taller than me and being leaner than me. You know, they're strong for their weight class and I'm just sure. strong at that sure. weight class. There's a difference. So every other ma every match is way more exhausting. Just trying to move someone at that, trying to move their legs at all. Right. Dealing with that, just that size advantage is not fun. I do not like competing at those weights. It just the incentive to lose the weight hasn't always been there because I kept winning. So it's like, right. sure, yeah. right. <clears throat> now you have an yeah. incentive. Now you want to lose it. <laughs> now, well, now, now it's a lot easier for me to really stick to stuff because like I said, I, I really did struggle with my mental health and then, I just have I just had such a good front that a lot of people would hear me talk about being bipolar and the struggle, but not see it. Sure. You know yeah. I mean? People that don't it, experience it can't really understand it. Sure. So no, uh, um, it, it's much easier for me to do stuff like diet now and maintain perfect control over everything. That's good on you too, man. Like you're so I don't know how many people in the BJJ community talk about it or have been open about it because it is, um, it's a savage sport. I mean, let's be honest. We've said it before on the show. We've talked about it a little bit today. You know, it's, it's not for everybody. Like we say, you know, George Gurgel, we had him on the show, ex UFC fighter. He's a color commentator for the Spanish side of UFC. Now he said it, you know, he was like, Look, jujitsu is for everybody, but not everybody's for jujitsu. And it's very straightforward to what you said tonight, Andrew, or t today, whatever. Um, but it, it's savage. But for you to come out, like a lot of people won't talk about it. And it's becoming more prevalent for people to talk about like, hey, mental illness is a real thing, man. And people are dealing with it every single day. And, you know, they need people, good people in their corner, good people at their table to circle around them and, you know, always be there for them. And then I'll also push them when they need to be pushed. And it sounds to me like that's what's going on for you right now, man. Like you've got good people around you, uh, backing, you know, backing you up and pushing you to be the best version and obviously investing in yourself. Like you're doing is the key. Like, don't, don't just look for someone else to do it. Everybody look to invest in yourself, be disciplined. So, okay, let me ramble for a second about Go ahead. mental health. All right. Uh, that concept of uh, help yourself is it sounds on paper like you're trying to be helpful by saying that, but the concept is toxic because you can't always help yourself. And not correct. You're not possible. You know, like you, theoretically, maybe you could, but you're, you can't. 
you're not going to be able to. Like you might I today, do but was, weeks down the road, yeah, you're not going to be able to. Something I couldn't do before is, is make appointments and stick to them. You know, I, I had to go to the doctor, anything like that. I'd have to wait until I was essentially manic and motivated to make the appointment. And if the appointment was too far off, by the time it came, my mental state had completely switched to something else. You know, the odds of me doing it were not good. And the odds of me following up past that appointment were zero. So there's a lot of times I'd go in and get something scanned and not be able to follow up at all. Sure. Because that's just how my mental health affected me. So, you know, the, the things, the advice I gave in my mental health video of how you can help your friend that you know struggling is like, yep. it's not going to be like pat him on the back and say, I'm here for you. I can talk. It's like, I needed someone to make the appointment for me for a doctor or a psychiatrist. And sure. I needed someone to keep me accountable and drive me to it and make sure I was going to get there. And let's not pretend that the medical system in America is good because I didn't have money to do it. So if someone could have paid for it, it would have happened a lot earlier probably. So I, I needed that from people, and that's what I think you can do to help people. It's not just uh, I'm here for you, man. It's like actually being there no. for someone yeah. is helpful. Take, take the reins. Take the reins of someone. If you if you experience someone going through something like that, be willing to step in and take the reins for that person to be their advocate. Yeah. And people have a front, and they're they're going to be defensive. I mean, oh, they're for sure, and try to downplay it. And if you have that insight that you know they're not doing well. Sometimes you got to push. Sometimes you got to show up at their house. You know, yep. I, I had one one person from the, uh, not even from my, my team, but uh, my friend Cody Kellison when I was on hiatus. You know, I didn't talk to anyone the whole time. Essentially, I, I completely went AWOL from social media. I stopped responding to messages and seminar offers. And I have like a 50 plus seminar offers I just didn't reply to. Man. Okay. Because yeah. I had just too much anxiety thinking about sure. jujitsu because I wasn't doing it. Sure. And right. all, all of the stuff related to that. And, you know, they just came to my house. He's like, dude, you, you fucking okay, motherfucker. And, you know, that was a good thing that he did. So it's funny because when, when Daisy Fresh first came out and Michael Sears was filming and Simone were filming, okay, before that I had never talked to people about my mental health struggles. I had put on enough of a front and pretended for everyone else in the world that it wasn't a thing and I was just like this buzzsawing machine. You know what I mean? And I remember making the decision to talk about it in my head. You know, I'm like, I'm fucking tired of hiding it pretending it's fine you know it's exhausting and it's not honest and being intellectually honest is, is really important to me so i said i obviously said a lot of shit in uh the first couple of daisy fresh episodes from all over the place right sure yeah and that that wasn't quite what i expected people to latch on to as hard as they did um because i only talk about it in there for what like 15 20 seconds say, uh, in that episode uh, yeah it's it's, it's like an much. off the cuff uh, hey guys i'm bipolar you know and People latched onto it. People, um, I would, I still get messages, but like back then, it was just the Daisy Fresh stuff. You know, I was getting hundreds of messages over the course of a month about people that are just like, "Thank you for talking about this. I struggle with this too." You know, and then it just, I always, I always knew that everyone out there struggled with stuff, but the sheer quantity and the impact that I had just by talking about it off the cuff like that was something that I became aware of. Okay, and it's like, uh. Nobody in our sport or in uh, macho sports in general really like to talk <clears throat> about mental health because right. it's not. There's a stigma against it already. It, it comes off as a sign of weakness if you're got a warped, twisted mentality and right. or some weird paradigms that you know. Not really your fault you had because that's just culturally conditioned into you. Yeah, exactly. But you know, it's like no one was talking about it, and I don't really have a problem talking about it. So I'm going to talk about it. I don't feel like I don't feel like a hero for talking about it. I'm literally just talking about experiences in my life yeah. and how important this stuff is. And I know it's important. And I know that me talking about it helps other people out there because now I get fucking 20 plus messages a day about it. And I mean, every single day, which is good. Man, saw my mental health video or see me talking about it somewhere. And it's just like messages, like how much it helped them. Um, when I went through my last big mental health video where I really went, this first time I really went into detail about it and like the, the nitty gritty detail of what it's like to live in my head and what it was like and how it's different now. That was the one that had the most impact, I think, because now not only did people realize that they actually need to go get help because they were able to identify with everything I was saying, but like I had fathers that were messaging me and like, they're like, I, I sat my whole family down after the video and we talked about the stuff that you talked about in the video and they were able to point out things to me that I hadn't noticed. And now we're going to go to group counseling, you know, stuff like that. Like people actually just accepting they need help and they're going to go get it. And they're aware of the situation now and it's going to be able to fix their life. Hopefully like it did mine. So 
I know everyone's getting sick of the mental health shit, but you better fucking suck it up because we're just getting started. <laughs> yeah, and it's legit, man. And and I'm with you 100 percent because it's plaguing more people than and than anyone would ever admit or. It's going to take people like you and 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 our show, whatever it takes, you know, to talk about it more and bring it to more of the forefront for people to actually be honest with themselves and to sit down because your life's going to be better. Your life's going to be better whenever you start getting this stuff fixed because there is it's a real thing, man. When I saw you start doing this, stuff, right? It might not be, but hey, it's 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 all over the place too. You know what I mean? Like it's different different areas and. When you started talking about it with videos, and you know, I know you posted that you, you and Bird did the did the video the couples and, counseling. Yeah, the couple yeah, have, couples counseling. We have more of those coming. Uh, nice. I have I have all of those planned out. I already know what I want to do for all of them. Good. And those are I really love fun. it because people are shy to click on the video still because they think it's going to be something cheesy and not right. Funny. Right. <laughs> click on it, people. Go watch everything that Andrew's posting out there because it's. He, just like he's speaking with us on the show is exactly how he speaks in all those videos. It's very forthcoming. When I met you, I felt very uh, like you were a very honest person and just straightforward in terms of like, you just told me like you even talked about then I have a weird memory. I remember a lot of just events so I can bring all the stuff back. We were standing in the back of the gym at East coast and bird was to the right of me and you were standing right to the left of me. And we were talking about um, taking days off, like, you, you guys, you know, like everyone perceives like, oh, it's train, train, train hundred percent every single day for 10 hours a day, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, you do need to take some, you do need to take a day off or something you talked about. Even to me, then you were talking about like your physical body. And I remember that to forever, like in my BJJ journey, it's like, yeah, not that anyone else has never said that, but it was just like, it was kind of big deal deal too. Cause you know, no, there's a lot of really talk. Listen, jujitsu, you guys might not want to hear this has a fucking toxic culture okay in a lot of different ways we have a lot of rampant sexism we have a lot of rampant discrimination yeah, sure. based on shit like you know if you're brazilian or not brazilian that the inherent hierarchy with the belt system is going to breed toxicity the clickiness of affiliations and gyms is going to breed toxicity the uh, tribalism with tournaments like our sport is set up to encourage this fucked up behavior okay and there's a lot of shit that I'm I'm gonna get around to, and you, I'm gonna shove it down your fucking throats until we stop. But like you were saying, the, one of the things we're really bad about is like jiu-jitsu people and don't really talk about overtraining and taking breaks. Okay, the the concept of go 100% all the time, like that's not what I do, and that's not what I think anyone should do. You can't do that unless you're Kanyan and you're in enough juice to fucking kill an elephant. <laughs> you know, he can keep up in the morning after doing the same routine as me and be fine. I have to like have riddle pull me out of bed okay <laughs> so yeah there's a lot of stuff like that that's just got to be talked about and weeded out sure good awesome. but, uh, that was a good one to bring up is the yeah. overtraining thing and the needing breaks like if i go to a tournament say the tournament was on saturday and i i do eight rounds between the, the open and my division and i go back on sunday you should take the sunday fucking night open mat off like yeah. for me it's more valuable than it is coming in just pre being tough and coming in and training the after a tournament the next day because if i don't take that day off i won't mentally reset and if i don't mentally reset sure. i'm gonna half-ass my training for the rest of the week so really i'm losing a week's worth of training because i wanted to prove i was tough and do that extra role in a day right. where i could have easily yeah. justified taking it off your body needs to recover sometimes your mind needs to recover sometimes like sports science it's it's figured out guys it's mm, not it, yeah. like we're in some nebulous magical sport where it doesn't apply you know you can get you can learn how to train more optimally for jiu-jitsu from any professional athletic coach in other sports that actually think they're a sport 100 percent. yep martial arts uh or jiu-jitsu is a martial art so it doesn't apply to us it doesn't <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna derail the conversation you brought up Please. riddle and i saw riddle okay. coming over how old is riddle now so Riddle was born on Christmas. Okay, he was born on December twenty fifth. I awesome. hope that's the date of Christmas, by the way. Yes, it yeah. is. Don't worry. You're good. Spot <laughs> yeah, on. So he, he's a he's a little over one year old now. So nice. You know, year, one year and almost two months. So he, I uh, want to enjoys having the yard. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome too, man. Yeah, because uh, you just you guys got the house not too long ago, right? Well, um, maybe five or six months ago. Because is it about five or six months ago? Okay. 
Yeah, when I said I took a month or five months off of training, I had lived in the house for four months, but the month where okay. I wasn't training while I was living in the box, when I found out my meniscus was torn, yeah, so that counts. Uh, so yeah, it's probably a five, five or six months awesome. now. Awesome, good. Uh, right. You know, I've got a couple of cats now, and I saw the cats I there have, in the background. That's my, awesome. My animals have a weird relationship. <laughs> so, well, no, I mean it's fucking weird. <laughs> like I, I watch Rico carry the cats around all the time just by the scruff of their neck and they just are all about it and they love it and they walk up to him and purr and like rub up on him and he just gets so excited. He's like a, he just loves attention from anything person, animal. It doesn't matter. He is just like the happiest dog. Is he a collie? Is he a right. mini collie? He, he's a, no, he's just a full blooded border collie. Oh, no, he's, sorry, a full- he's a, he's a, Border Collie Australian Shepherd mix. Okay, he's, he's a, he a is Border Collie. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, he looked like it, and when we had Clay on the show, I know Clay has Raven, right? And he has uh, one of Riddle's uh, litter mates. Yes. Litter mates, right? Very, very um, shepherd, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, that's that's uh one thing I I wanted to tell you. Mad props, dude, because I watched the videos where you were training Riddle, and I'm a, such a stickler of telling people all the time. I'm like. You can't have dogs unless you train them. You can't have dogs unless you train them because you're going to fail your don't dog. Get a fucking border collie, you know? or yeah, a dog that's very high maintenance. Like we have, I have three dogs now. I have a very big dog, which um, Chad got to experience her her anger side actually. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Chad boy. was like, she's going to eat. I have a cane corso that's 125 pounds. Um, that is a big dog. Yeah. And she came to greet uh, Chad and his girlfriend. And then she was upset because Chad has a long beard. And I tried to tell him that it's all his fault, but I'm just kidding. Keep going after that beard. Yes. Huh? yes, yes yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Cause it always gets in my way when I try to loop choke him or anything, which never really happens. I'm just joking. Everybody <laughs> I'll get paid for it this week. So, um, but no, the, uh, we have two GSPs, which are German short hair pointers and, uh, they're very high maintenance dogs. Um, but like just been working on training them a lot. And it, I told clay the same thing. Like it was just mad props to you guys for training your dogs, like going into the, you know, going into their bed with a treat and teaching them to come out all that stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Like, Andrew lives, lived in a box, no disrespect. You lived in a box behind the gym and you were still training your dogs. <laughs> Is yeah, a box still um, there? So, yeah. Yeah. Now it's a uh, Jordan Butler living on it. Oh, okay. So, nice. Yep. So here, let's, let's rant about dog training real quick. Uh, <laughs> Cause everyone that in the world has this weird Dunning Kruger effect when it comes to dog training where they think they know what they're doing. And instead they're just doing the absolute worst things because that's what their parents did. Okay, so a good example of this is as you have a dog and you catch him peeing on the carpet. What's the natural American response? You rub the dog's nose in the carpet and you maybe you swat him with right. a newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Now you've given it's that dog fucking anxiety about ever. peeing yep. in general because they don't know the yep. difference between carpet and not carpet. They don't yep. want to pee in front of you anymore. And now they have the possibility to develop weird complexes and anger and aggression issues because you don't know what you're doing. Yep. Okay, and there's a lot of subjects like that where it's not hard to go and Google for 30 seconds and especially now yeah read, read sure. one discussion thread where people you can clearly get the consensus of what where which direction to go okay but people are uh people in general and obviously obviously i'm not immune to this i have to update old information with new information all the time and ca- make sure that my current model is up to date and i have to do that all the time and catch myself when i'm not doing it but with dog training it's really bad because there's a right way and a wrong way And the wrong way is to use negative reinforcement. Yep. Okay. A hundred percent. Or I get, so there's different ways of referring to that. People think negative reinforcement is, uh, yeah, you know, sure. Like really negative reinforcement is, is, uh, taking something away from them. Okay. That's what negative reinforcement would be, but there's like a positive negative reinforcement. That's you positive reinforcement is you doing an action. And so that would also apply hitting the dog to giving them a treat. But really, when I'm saying positive reinforcement, I mean bribing the dog. Okay, that's what I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. And the healthiest way to train your dog is to teach them what you want them to do and encourage the good behavior while preventing them through distractions or by physically controlling their environment from doing the behavior you don't want them to do. Okay, so if you see a, so, so first off, you should be paying attention to puppies. And not giving them the opportunity to pee on the carpet. Take them out more frequently. 
Yep. There, it's it's uh, tedious and it takes a lot of time yep. and focus. But do the puppy dance now. So. <laughs> you take them outside before they have an accident, not after. Yep. Okay. And then when you take them outside and they pee on the carpet, what they're going to do is they're going to associate the texture of the grass with where they should urinate. Okay. And with dog urine, there's enzymes in them in the urine that dogs can smell that makes them want to pee in the same areas over and over. All right. And then you let the dog pee. What you can do is you can say a word and that's your P command. And you want words to be associated with the action that they are already doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they're peeing. You're like potty, potty. Okay. So then they start to associate with the word with what they're doing. And then you reward the fuck out of them. Yep. Okay. You, it's, it's, you just did the best thing ever. Here's treats. Here's attention and love. And yeah. And now let's play something. Let's do something real fun Mm -hmm. to make you forget you just peed. Then we go inside. Then you go inside. Take them straight inside. They might learn that outside's fun, and if they pee, they have to go inside right away. So there's attention breaks in between. Mm -hmm. Right now, what do you do if you catch your dog peeing on the carpet? Well, you don't yell at them. You don't freak out. You don't do something to make them anxious. You can be like, "Uh oh." You can you can pick the dog up, but don't shake the baby. Okay, pick the (laughs) dog up and and just walk them outside. Okay, yeah. You can interrupt what they're doing in a non-harmful way. Walk yep. them outside. You do the same thing. You get them to pee in the carpet or the fucking grass, unless you're <laughs> a psychopath. Okay? <laughs> you do the same thing. You reward them, and you go inside, and you use puppy urine cleaner to clean the carpet. Because if you use regular cleaner, there's still going to be the enzymes in the carpet yep. that's going to make them more likely to pee in the same spot again. Okay. So that is an example of easy dog training and how you're supposed to do it. And how people are just not aware. Now, what do you do if the dog keeps peeing in the same spot because you just missed it too many times? Well, one, you're gonna if it's like a carpet, you might have to prevent them from being in that area of the carpet. Block them okay, off you might have to put some off, kind of yeah. different, yeah, block them off or put a different texture down over the area, something that's not the same texture that they're feeling when they're wanting to go to the bathroom. Okay, and preventing be- or like f- correcting bad behavior is significantly harder than preventing it. Okay, so if you had done a better job of paying attention to the puppy, yep. you'd have got them outside earlier. They wouldn't have peed, but you you didn't do a good enough job. So now you have to break a behavior. The way to break a behavior, again, it's not going to be through yelling at the dog. It's going to be preventing the dog from having access to the behavior. Okay, or break. You know, it's like don't let them go to that area where they're peeing yep. unless you are have them on a leash and you're physically in control of the dog. Okay, and this is why it's just easier to do it right the first time. And so if people would put the work really in for you get a dog, right. P- if people would put the work in, cause you know, they want the dog, they want the puppy, they want the loves and cuddles and all that. But at the end of the day, I go, you wanted that dog. So if you're going to scream and smack that dog for something they did, then I want you to go look in the mirror, scream at yourself and smack yourself in the head. Yeah. Would, because, you, would you smack your child for that? Like right. if you yeah. would, your parenting ideals yeah, are so, not good. <laughs> not good. You know, you the question is Andrew, the relationship between you and the dog. Right. Doing that. We have to figure out how to implement these type of training skills into BJJ, right? I used to give my kids in the kids class like Skittles and shit when they did it right. So. <laughs> hey, you already, that, my kid, my kid is, would be like, dude, I want to go to that. <laughs> that was not a joke. That was not I'm a sure joke. I'm sure it wasn't. No, for sure. And I would catch myself, you know, like a, my, my marker word for when the dogs do something right is yes in the same tone of voice <laughs> every time. And then the kids in the kids class would do something right and I would be like, yes, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> That's so. awesome. I actually have a lot of thoughts on how to teach BGJ better, by the way. And I'm you gonna is that a future dream, Jim? You know, it's gonna be an hour long video I'm about to put out. I mean, nice. do you? I mean, do you want to have like you want to own your own gym? You want to, you know, future? Tra- oh, I, yeah, train I, I, and teach absolutely. I'm gonna run my own gym, gym one day, and uh, nice. I think I'm gonna be a fantastic instructor for competitors and non-competitors because I don't, yeah. I really don't only cater to competitors. I obviously have a competitive mindset. But like I said, I don't care if you compete. I just I, like I love having more masters competitor or masters people in a room in general than I do like having like super high level athletes, honestly, sure. because they're usually a little smarter, a little more world experience, and they help mm-hmm. ground the athletes. You know, so mm-hmm. I think yeah. there's a good middle ground between you know having a, an environment that a lot of casual people can come in and enjoy while still maintaining your competition integrity. You know, and I think the two sure. sides actually enable each other because competitors can't do anything on their own. They're fucking useless. All they do is jujitsu. Okay. They don't have money. Right. Uh, they're, they're doing what you know, I have no problem with that because that, you know, that was me, but 
if it wasn't for the older people in the room and the people that were giving life lessons to people like me, you know, things would have been different. And there were a lot of times I wouldn't be able to go to tournaments if I didn't have help and support from the people that just want to be part of something. Sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. Definitely, man. But I'm, I'm definitely going to run a gym someday. So this is going to lead me into asking you the question then of, I know you want to have your own gym and I saw a post that you just posted recently. We won't keep you much longer. We've kept you up well more than I listen. I can talk you. for 10 hours. So <laughs> I, I, I literally just, this is what I enjoy doing. I enjoy mentally stimulating conversation and, and feel like I wanted to be a philosopher before I figured I out remember you saying that when we were, when we so, were talking. Yeah. You, you loved, like we talked about that. We talked about, you know, how, how you grew up and stuff and that you thought that that's actually what you were going to end up doing. Um, I thought I was going to be a philosopher and an yeah. author, you know, and then I yeah. ended up strangling people for a living, <laughs> which will make you a great coach because you're going to be able to take all the life lessons and everything that you've ever absorbed throughout your time. And you can put it in a good Te- a good context of philosophy and learning and teaching to others. So you're going to be able to pass the torch for BJJ and the ability to understand something. You're someone who's dealing and has dealt with mental illness. You're someone who's competed at the highest level at a BJ and BJ, yeah, BJJ tournaments on mat, off mat, whatever, doesn't matter. So you have a good sources of both worlds. So I'm telling you right now, I know for a fact, man, you're going to do, you're going to have great success in the future to have your own gym and teach people. The other day I saw a post that you talked about doing the, um, the GoFundMe or because I'm terrible at this, whatever the other people can donate to about getting stuff for other people for like gym memberships or something. I want you to, I want you to talk about that. let, let, Let me talk about that. Okay. So for the longest time, I, I never wanted to do any kind of Patreon or any kind of GoFundMe because of the stigma associated with it, okay? Sure. And not, like I said, when I made the post, you know, I, I'd been a couple of weeks of being able to think clearly and starting to realize that, look, I can be consistent and I can do things like this now and make sure and not have to worry about losing myself. I really think I'm okay. And I think it's going to continue. Now it's been even longer and I'm more confident in that, okay? So it's like, you know, getting significantly more involved with not just the gym itself, you know, because I made, I came back after being gone for as long as I did, but because I'm so much more clear thought and in my ability to process everything and be consistent, I've been pouring myself much more into other people at the gym than I used to. Okay. Because sometimes I would just struggle. Like anyone that ever asked me a question about jujitsu, I will fucking go off on teaching, but you know, it's like, I would let people come to me. And that's, uh, that's not really how I like to be. I want to be the person that's going out of my way to help. Sure. So yeah. I was able to start doing that. And you know, I, I have my own money through BGJ Fanatic sales now. And these guys that live in the gym don't. You know, They're doing what sure. I did. They're right. working Fujis because <clears throat> that's the only way they can kind of like make enough money to get food and go to tournaments. Mm-hmm. You know? and, and all the people that are saying like they should just get a, a full-time job or a part-time job um, – you're you're honestly just being an asshole and not thinking at all or not understanding the context of what they're trying to do. Okay. Tell me that they're going to go work a full-time job and then beat the Ruotulo brothers. Right. Uh, who don't have yeah. to work. They have rich parents that encourage them to do their sport all day long since they were children. Okay. The, the reason people move here to train and move to gyms to train is to try to be that good. These, these people want to chase their dream and other people are just shitting on them. Because of warped values and not having any empathy. Okay. So what I've been doing is, you know, I, I give my own money back to the gym all the time. And I, I fixed all the electricity in the gym. I hired an electrician. I got finally got a washer and a dryer installed. I put a new sink in. I fixed the door. I finally got a clock. Uh, you know, there's a lot. Of, I put five or six grand back into the gym already. Okay. And, you know, that's something I could never, never have done before. But the people in the gym. I'm trying to help them too. You know, I'm, I, I've sponsored people in the gym for tournaments now and uh, they, you know, they don't know what to eat. They don't know how to diet. And I took them and bought them food and got them some protein. And, and I was just thinking, how do I improve the living situation for the guys in there? And what else can I do to help? Okay. And you start to come up with this list of things you want to do to fix the gym up. Like I just bought and had the guys build and I was there talking shit to them the whole time. But, you know, I, I funded it and got it there and got the tools and got someone who knew what they were doing to help us all do it. 
but I built another shed outside, like a big metal shed. So the guys in the gym that moved here and had a suitcase and stuff have somewhere to store it. That's not just out in the open in the gym and it can make the nice. situation easier with more space. Okay. You know, so little things like that go a long ways. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the concept that I was approaching the idea with. And there's also the other side of this, that I get so many messages. I mean, like, you know, I only have 40,000 followers on Instagram, but I have like a vocal following. Okay. And sure, yeah. they, they, they reach out to me all the time. And a lot of them are just people that were like me when I lived in Michigan. They, uh, they don't know where they're going in life, but they know this is their passion and they just want to have the opportunity to, to do what I got to do, but they don't have money. They don't, they were just like me and they can't all just drive. I was lucky. I had a car and I drove myself 13 hours. Okay. They can't do that. And I can't buy them all flights. I will go broke. I've been broke. Right. Right. I, yeah. You know, it's just not, it's just, it's, it's one of those things where I, I genuinely want to help, but I also have to be smart about how I help. I can't literally just give away all my money all the sure. time. Sure. Right. I can be, I can be helpful. So I thought the, I thought we had, you know, some goodwill with the community. And I know there's a lot of people that the Daisy Fresh story <clears throat> and the concept behind it of being able to live your dream and uh, not be from a very, you know, well funded, fancy gym full of black belt world champions and still be able to, to to have the success we've had essentially the story is anyone can do it that's the fucking whole motto behind daisy fresh if we can do it you can do it okay and so all i did was i brought up uh the idea for discussion on reddit how would you guys think about this and i got pretty viciously attacked in a lot of very mean ways by people who were intentionally misrepresenting what i said really? or like wow. I said, just you know, it was bad. It really made me disheartened with the Reddit community. I guess I'm not and surprised because they've been my fans, and they're usually I thought they were better than this. Mm -hmm. You know, it was stuff like, uh, "Well, why should I donate any money to people that just don't want to have jobs? Like but, what they're doing isn't important to them. Like they're not trying to live their sure. dream, and like, uh, like they're not going to have any ability to reach back and give out to others later on in their life. You know, it's like uh, there's just a lot of cold heartedness behind that statement. Like if you didn't want to. Donate to a GoFundMe. That's fine. Don't yeah, be a dick. Just don't, you don't have yeah. to say anything. You know, right. Like, like, again, the Daisy Fresh story itself is just like with people reaching out to me for mental health. I know for a fact through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages and comments that just what we do and the story that's been told about us so far is helping people with their lives. You know, and wh whatever they get from it, that's what they tell me. And sometimes it's like, a, no, it's really cool. And sometimes it's like, look, this I relate to this in so many ways, and I, I fucking I love that you guys do this. Okay, it's like pretending that those people have nothing behind what they're saying, you know. So again, I think it's really shallow, unempathetic thinking that leads to the comments that I was getting. Sure. And the whole point was I wanted to be able to have a fund, okay, and I wanted it to be attached to a separate bank account. And I was really looking for thoughts and ideas as well as how the PME would respond to this and. Um, I did get thoughts and ideas. Okay. Like I want to do a lot of, uh, like raising funds. I don't want to just ask for donations, but I, like right. my current, what I want to go with, and this is after talking to the community, which was really toxic, but I was able to pull some good from it. Um, like I want to do like web seminars with me, couch and George at the gym or, or where we're going to go. Be so great. Yeah. Just, like <laughs> once a month or something like that, you can Q and a, ask us what you want to see. You can ask us to fucking roll and fondle each other. I don't care. <laughs> you know, and just have a donation set up, you know, free sure. seminar. If you guys want to donate, you can donate. Okay. And then people want me to do merchandise. That's something I can definitely do and something I can make happen. It's, it's, again, it's, it's got to be linked to a separate account. So that way there can be accountability with the funds. And I was very clear, very, very clear that I said that, you know, I don't want just money that I can access myself. I want money that I can show on a statement what it's being sent towards, sure. whether it's buying someone a flight, signing them up for a tournament. Um, I wanted the option to use some of it to fix some of the shit in the gym because Heath and them think we're going to get a new building, but they've also been saying that for six plus years. <laughs> I'm not convinced it's going to happen, and I want to <laughs> fix the, the, what we have now as much as I can. No more instead, possums in the know? attic uh, or in the. I don't want to fuck another possum falling through on goddamn people <laughs> sleeping in the gym, you know. So it's just that, like, I, I genuinely have good intentions on this, and you know, I got I got other good ideas. Um, Stuff like doing the seminars, you know, doing events, hoking, like hosting in-house tournaments. Tournaments, or, yeah. Yeah, you know, in-house like, tournaments would be awesome. Doing the, the, the matches, you know, people, I think people would be interested in that, you <laughs> know, and sure. uh, people talked about doing a Daisy Fresh Patreon, and I would, by knife point, make the guys that are like high-level guys like Couch and George and them do videos for it, and, you know, do technique sure. 
stuff on uh, request and stuff like that, just a way to keep some consistent income going to this account so I can keep helping the people in the gym because, you know, Daisy Fresh is about the people. Sure. And that's been you know, proven. They if can you, do it on their own. Right. But we can if, help them still. You know? If no one's ever watched the documentary or seen the, tr- the I want to say the true, the original guys who, who did it, who was in the documentary when Flo came, you know, all you listeners out there, Andrew's on to something here that's huge and it's huge for the BJJ community because it's not only going to grow the community, it's going to make you even understand more how much we are a family. We try to help out as much as we can. Chad and I have tried to help out as many people as we can just with this podcast, with sponsoring people for shows. We started our own tape business um, called Limitless Tape to where we try to sponsor athletes and support them as much as we can. We're not making any money, man. We've been doing this for a year. We're not trying to make any money. I work a full-time job. Chad you know, runs the gym. I have kids and all that. But my thing is I grew up rough. So I grew up in government lines of getting food, um, you know, spam and, you know, powdered milk and all that crap. So I know what that's like. And I want people to be successful now. And if I see them going for a dream, it's, it intrigued me so much, Andrew, when you posted this, cause I was like, man, he's on to something like, this is something people need to get behind. And if someone's doubting that you're going to not use this money, right. The guy lived in a freaking separate. He lived in a box, man. He lived in a gym. What the heck do you think he's going to do? Like he, like he's not, he's not at, he would have asked a long time ago. <laughs> I can get my own orange chicken guys. <laughs> I can. <laughs> Um, so I did get one comment that, um, so when I, when I originally was thinking about the idea, I was thinking pretty small. Okay. Like if, if I got any amount of money, it's just going to be money that's going to immediately be useful. But someone said, uh, would you be willing to help someone move out to Atos to train? Mm-hmm. And honestly, yes. You know, it's like, I don't want to just enable the people that are around me. Right. I want people to be able to do what I got to do. And it if you have, have an opportunity to, to put in someone in a position, there's a lot right. of places where, but again, like I was when I originally had the idea, I was obviously thinking it smaller, but right. I don't, I don't know how feasible this is at all, but I would love to do something bigger, some kind of uh, like be able to actually help people get to tournaments in general or sure. help people get to where they need to be to train and help them actually survive while they're training. But I would need help with that. I'm uh you know, I'm a professional jujitsu athlete who's not an idiot, but I also do not have professional organizational and money financing sure. skills. And, and I, I do think don't. that there are people in the community that I could <laughs> that get do. in touch with yes, yes. that would help Definitely. me. And that's also what I was kind of looking for when I made the thread. I was like, people are going to know a lot about this already. This is a brand new topic for me. And if I just ask, people will know and they will probably be able to reach out and help me. So what's the harm? Yeah. Well, it turns out the harm is a toxic uh, – vocal probably minority that decides to do what they do and you've been around long enough to understand that social media can be an extremely toxic environment whether it's on reddit instagram facebook twitter it doesn't matter where it's at people are going to come after you because you're looking to do something good it seems to be the thing to do now i already knew that there was a there's definitely a subset of the community that is waiting for a reason to attack me and waiting for a reason to attack Daisy Fresh because not everyone likes us. Yeah. And we make a lot of waves in ways that people don't like. We're, I'm pretty anti-establishment when it comes to the culture of jiu-jitsu. I'm open sure. about the fact that having to bow to your instructor and all the culty conditioning stuff and the shady marketing practices is something I'm very much against and I will destroy if you give me enough time. And that I'm a direct threat to people that are happy with the status quo. So if I give them any opportunity, they're going to take it. You know, and I knew when I uh, made the post, I was putting myself out there in a vulnerable position where people could actually have finally this motherfucker slipped up and I can go in on him. You just want money. (laughs) You know, it's like I I knew that already and I knew that going in, but I still was a little bit discouraged, but I'm not discouraged to the point where I'm stopping. And if the ball is rolling, I'm talking to an accountant and we're going to talk about setting up a nonprofit and I'm going to work out all the details and I appreciate any help I get in this, but I don't need the help. I'm going to do it anyways. So I suspect people might attack us now, Chad. You ah, answer, you answer all the comments. <laughs> by association. I'm okay you with that. Brazilians are, you know how many Brazilians are pissed off in my career, man? <laughs> <laughs> I just think it's a great idea because I want people to succeed in something they're passionate about. And if there's something out there that we are able to put forth for people to do that, then I'm all in. Then I'm, I'm willing to help. Yeah, and, it's, 
you know, I want people to be able to do something that they love to do. And I know how this sport can change your life. Um, and I, and in a short period of time, I understand that. And people like yourself, Andrew, and I've seen, you know, just from documentary and then obviously talking to you for the period of time, I really, uh, enjoyed the time that we got to talk in the, uh, in the gym that time, you know, no cameras, no nothing around, you know, it really, you know, I'm older than you obviously, but it reflected on me on terms of the BJJ world and community. So when I saw it I, just I recently, go ahead. I'm, I'm pretty much the same off camera as I am on camera, right? Like, absolutely. Like as far oh, as no, know, no, no. I, yeah. A hundred percent. You're no, you're not. Yeah, there is nothing different about I, my persona is the hundred percent me. <laughs> you right, you're just you. Yeah, what you see is what you get. what you see is what you get. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off there. By the way, no, 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 you're fine, man. No, no worries at all. Um, so if there's anything that we can do to, uh, you know, post anything, or if there's other people that we can maybe reach out to, or someone that could want to come on and talk about it more, you know, let us know, Andrew. Obviously, keep us in the loop. Um, I think it's a great thing. Yeah, if you're sending someone to autos in order to train maybe there's grants or scholarships some weird sense of i don't want to use those terms because i know people associate those terms with other other things but maybe there's something like that that can be done and um, we can put people in places where they can follow their dream man and be able to be supported uh, more than maybe what people were in the in the world i I don't just think that we have a monopoly on trying to live your dream and do good things in jiu-jitsu you know atos uh, AOJ is a good team, you know, Gracie Baja has some good schools. There's a lot of areas out there. There's even garage gyms that are doing what we do and they're having success. You know, right. there's just, it's not just about us. There's a lot of good out there. And I, I, in an ideal world, everyone gets to do what I got to do at any of these different locations. Definitely. Good stuff, man. Yeah. We, uh, I'm going to just ask you this. Andrew, go ahead and shout out how everyone can get to you since we've got you for um, like an hour and 40 minutes. I think we've, which you, I know you don't like care. Like I said, but. I literally, <laughs> I, I don't really have an off button when it comes to time. Hey, we gotta, we gotta save something for part two. Part two. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you guys want to get a hold of me, okay. I get a lot of messages on Instagram every day, like 50 to 100 every single day, and I, I do my best to, to at least read them, and I can't always reply to all of them. Sometimes I'm not mentally – I'm exhausted, or there wasn't even a question for me to answer. It was just a kudos kind of thing, and you know, uh, but I do try to reply to the ones that need responded to. So if you guys want to reach out to me on Instagram, I think my handle is andrewwiltsy46, but if you probably just look up Andrew Wiltsy, you'll find me. Okay. Um, Facebook is not as easy because I have a friend limit cap that I've, I hit a long time ago and I don't want to start an athlete page. But, um, like I said, I, I give my phone number out my instructionals even like, I'm not really concerned. Don't call me please. But <laughs> <laughs> you can, you can text me and then we can go from there. Okay. My number is 618-316-8485. All right. And I try to reply on that too. So, um, there's a lot of ways to reach out for me. If you guys want to come visit or come train at the gym, I usually, uh, before I would tell people to reach out to the Pedago Submission Fighting page, but mostly that was because I didn't trust my organizational skills to get you out here. Um, I, you can reach out to Pedago Submission Fighting or you can reach out to me and I'll do my best to help you. So good, man. Yeah. Andrew, thank you so much, man, for hanging out with us, talking all this stuff. It's some great stuff. Um, obviously we'll keep you posted everyone out there, all our listeners, as always, everything will be in the show notes for you to click on, to go to, to find anything that you need. Um, and just thanks, man, Andrew. And, you know, good. I want the best for you, man. I, I want you to succeed in everything that you're doing uh, going forward, man. Bless you and everything and keep up the great work, I, man. I, I appreciate that. And uh, we're going to keep on doing what we do and uh, we'll see where we end up. Awesome, dude. Thanks, man, so much. And Chad has checked out already. So he's I'm gone just, already. <laughs> I, he's, I, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, My camera went off. Your camera went off. Okay. Yeah, right. I don't know what happened. It's all good. We're going to say bye to Andrew now. So Chad, say bye to Andrew. <laughs> I got a one thing before we go. Oh yeah, yes. go ahead. We were talking about how you were excited to be five foot nine earlier, right? Uh, hell yeah. So one of my good friends and training partners, Tim Simpson, he's a big fan of yours, but he always tells everybody he's five, nine on a six foot frame. So think about that. 
actually a funny funny little anecdote there okay my dad it was is uh six two he's fucking huge he's got size like no joke his shoe size is over 20 okay so my dad's massive and he's the strongest person still to this day other than kanye that i've ever seen but you know, we all know how, why kanye is strong okay <laughs> and i just thought i got genetically fucked in that i you know i didn't get his uh size and i you know, I, I'm actually decently strong when I, I'm no, I'm not as strong as my dad. I watched him pick up a car engine one time Ooh. and it turns out I have scoliosis. I found out when oh. I was like 15 or 16. Wow. My spine, you know, most people's spines are nice and straight. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You know, mine is, uh, mine's a little curious about its own yep. sexuality and yeah. it likes to do a couple of little, <laughs> mm-hmm. little bendies. Yeah. I think I've lost inches based on that. Probably. So, you you will. My mom has taller. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. My mom has scoliosis. Uh, she was born with it and uh yeah, it's slowly and slowly she's 62 now. Mom doesn't listen to the show so she can't yell at me. I'm not going to live that long. So <laughs> right. that. You'll live that long, man. You'll live that long. You'll have an awesome gym and people will talk about how you started an organization to to get people in the gyms training jujitsu and it changes the era of learning, man. Trust me. Don't doubt yourself. You know that. You know better than that. You got this. All right, brother. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate you and everything you're doing. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, um, for sure. And if you want me to ramble any other time, let me know. I can. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Absolutely, brother. All right, man. Take care. We'll see you. All right. Yep. I'll see you guys later. All right.